So here we are. Welcome to Titi Boy TV. Today we have a very special guest. The first and most successful female director of porn history. Sort, sort of. of. Uh, you know who was first? Who? Uh, um, who is it? Who is it? Adam and Eve. Uh, Candida. I think Candida was actually first. Oh, okay. Candida was around when I came around. But, uh, you know, she was doing very specific stuff, God rest her soul. And it was not what I envisioned. So you know how I got in the business? No, but I only got a lot of questions. Okay. You got to okay. go slow. Okay. <laughs> so, and uh, one of the, a very serious businesswoman. So please welcome Kelly Holland. Thank you for coming. No, it's a pleasure being here. How are you? I'm really good. I don't think we were, we rarely have ever actually had more than three or four sentences between us because you're always going one way, I'm going the other. We're at a trade show. It's like, hey, how are you doing? Or we're at an award show. So it's nice to sit and actually talk to you. Yeah, pretty much totally, right? Yeah. I just remember one time you directed me in a scene. I think it was at Milton Ingley Studio, and it was in the bathroom. It was a kind of like a supposed to be a dirty idea. And I, I, yeah, I just remember I said, wow, she's pretty sexy. But, you know, was I nice to you? Was I a good director to you? Yeah, you're great. Okay. You know, I like, of course, I looked at you while you were directing us, and I probably got more excited because I was kinky like that. But you were, you're sexy and pretty, and I love redheads. So you remember, you remember that time? I, rem I remember directing you. I did not remember. It was at Milton English Studio. There's a blast from the past on, uh, on, uh, what was that street? Mag Chandler. Yeah, Chandler. Like Chandler. And uh, yeah, I just remember directing you one time. But now you make me blush, so. <laughs> did I do a good job for you? I think you, well, I don't even have to remember it to remember that you did a good job because you always did a good job. Yeah. You always did a good job. I think you caught me right in my prime when I was a beast. Did I tell you not to be a beast, though? See, I, I th for some reason, I think I, I feel like I must have said... Calm down, slow down. <laughs> don't be, don't be TT boy to the full extent. Yeah, I think I probably asked you to just chill a little bit, even though it was a dirty scene. Yeah, well, you heard stories about TT boy getting crazy. Uh, of course, of course. Who hasn't? Yeah. Who hasn't? All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you have accomplished a lot, right? Can you tell me about how you got in the business? Yeah, it was crazy. Uh, I was a war zone journalist. I was covering. You didn't know that. No. Let's see, now you're going to find out a bunch. Wow, of stuff. that's what I want to yeah. learn. I uh, I was covering the wars in Central America, so I was covering Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, mainly uh, El Salvador and the dirty war in El Salvador. And um, is that part of the Oliver North situation? Yeah, that was dead center in Oliver North. That was the Iran Contra time. As a matter of fact, I worked with another producer who did. Uh, a very big documentary called Cover Up Behind the Iran-Contra Hearings. So we were all about Oliver North smuggling and directing the smuggling of cocaine and the crack epidemic that the CIA started in South Central and the flights into the illegal flights into um, Costa Rica. I was actually at those airfields and chatting with the CIA and the in San Salvador. Oh yeah, it was a big time. Listen, I have a quick little story on that. Tell me, me and tell Dion, me. you know Dion, yeah, Dion Russo. Yeah, we were in Lake Havasu. 10 years ago, right? And something happened to my jet ski or we needed whatever, you know? And we run up to this um, little shop, right? Little mechanic shop, you know, jet ski, whatever, boat shop right on the water, mm -hmm. right? And this guy saw me and Dean walking up and I was pretty good, pretty, I was bigger, you know? And Dion's pretty big. And he, I saw, I watched him closely. He got real paranoid. He grabbed his ratchet took it apart, you know, because it had extension on it. Mm -hmm. So he had two pieces of steel in his hand just in case, right? And he just looked at us and I, you know, I saw right away, I know, you know, I know what to do when this situation happens. But, you know, we befriended him and he told us, he was like 75 yep. or 77. He's told us about running all the drugs on the airplanes. Oh, wow. Right? And he said one time <laughs> he landed in a, he got, was taken down in Central America. They pulled him down or something, yeah, you know, yeah, from yeah. the sky. Yeah. Kind of like Tom Cruise movie, right? Yeah, they yeah, pulled yeah. him down and they said, you know, they, they knew he was running drugs. 
maybe Nicaragua, wherever it yeah, was, yeah, Costa Rica, yeah. Yeah. someplace. And they took him to jail. And he said, just call this number, just like the movie. But this is before a Tom Cruise yeah, movie. Yeah. And he said, after I gave him that card, they went out and drank and got high. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, but he, and they killed, he said they killed all his friends. Wow. That did it. And so he was the last one. Well, no wonder he picked up that. Uh, That's a trip, that right? That's a trip. That so, was going on. All of that stuff is true. That's not that, you know, you can't call it conspiracy theory. All that stuff was happening. Was that, tell was me more. Border. I was on the border of uh, Nicaragua and Honduras. And, uh, you know, Nicaragua had the Sandinistas who had taken over the government when they had a very corrupt president who had just drained the country of, of its money and then split and taken billions of dollars into Miami or Switzerland or wherever he took it. And um, his name was Samosa. And, um, and then the Sandinistas come in and they're, you know, a bunch of kids who had gone up into the mountains in support of the revolution. They'd gone up when they were 16 and now they come down out of the mountains and they're 20 they spent four years up there eating bugs and bark and nothing else. And now they've got to run this country that's just decimated. So um, they had a good relationship with the United States for a few year, for a few months, actually. And then Reagan was elected and Reagan decided they were a communist threat, which they were not. But so that starts the Iran-Contra business and that starts the Contras who were in the neighboring. They were they were Nicaraguans, but they were operating out of the neighboring country, Honduras. And uh, they would make these midnight raids into the con- into Nicaragua, and they would blow up the daycare centers and blow up the healthcare clinics and blow up the ha- the low income housing, and then they'd run back across the border into Honduras. And that drug smuggling was supporting their operations. They were completely ineffectual, <laughs> but it didn't really matter because you know you get a philosophy and you get on this track and you can't get off of it. You know if you're the government, and uh, that was what that clandestine uh, uh, operation was really about. So I was up on that border. I was in a little con- a little town called Esteli in Nicaragua. It's just five miles maybe from the border. Uh, did did a bunch of interviews in that area, interviewing people who you know had had their their homes burned by the Contras and da 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 da. Anyway, so it was a trip. It was a trip, and I loved it. At the time I was doing it, I was still coming back into L.A. because I had edit bays here. I had post-production facilities in Hollywood. So I would come back and I would edit whatever it was that I shot, deliver it to whoever I was going to sell it to, and then I'd go down and start working on another story. So during that period... Uh, what well, year is this? This is 19... I, the first time I went down was 1985. And I went down until uh, 1990. I was in and out for five years. And then the peace accords were signed in Central America. And I came back and I started working on three documentaries for Australian broadcasting. And they were focused on things that were particularly American culture, Americana culture in a way. So the first documentary I did was on guns in America. It was called Critical Mass. The second documentary I did was on the healthcare crisis in America. Nothing's changed. Wow! So I didn't. So back then there was a crisis. Uh, oh yeah, a huge crisis. If wow. you if you had a pre-existing condition, same thing. Same thing as really. Wow! Now. I didn't know that. If you had a pre-existing condition, you were screwed. You didn't have you know money for healthcare, and you didn't have an employer that provided. You were screwed. Your healthcare was an emergency room. Wow. Uh, you know you had the gun documentary, same as it is now. You know, even the police felt they were un, they were outgunned on the street. At that time, gangs were really big. Crips and the Bloods were in a full, full-on full war. And the cops felt they were completely outmanned because everybody had, you know, automatic weapons. So same issues applied in wow. 1986, 87, 88. Anyway, so then Australian Broadcasting said, okay, we've got a third one we want to do, but we don't know what we want to do it on. Like, what is particularly... Like, what do you think is symbolic of American culture? Well, at that time, uh, in my edit bays, Jim Steele, who was the gay director for Vivid, he directed a line called Vivid Men or Vivid Man, was editing a movie with Shishi LaRue. It's called Prince Charming. What year? That's 90 or no? That was probably 91. Okay. You know? So they're in my edit bay editing. And I had no idea who they were or what they were editing. I happened to open the door and walk into it and go, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did you feel about that? And Jim, well, it was fine. Jim and Larry both turned around and they said, oh, are you okay with what we're doing? I was like, you know, I was a progressive, liberal, free speech person. I was like, yeah, I'm okay with it. 
And so through that experience, I met, I guess probably because I was billing Vivid for it, I met Marcy, who was ha- somehow handling something. Marcy, who was the operations person. Marcy Hirsch at Vivid, who's the sister. So she was here earlier, you know, last week or the week yeah. before last. She said she started in 1992, so that must have been 92. Was, okay, it was 92. Yeah, that's interesting. So uh, I met Marcy, and... Uh, and then she said, oh, well, so we've got our, our gay lines editing at your place. Would you like to edit compilations, right? You know what compilations are. You take five movies and you take a scene from every movie and you find the common theme and you make this thing called a compilation. And she said, we've got this director, PT. He's a really big director. <laughs> and uh, we want, he's like, he's the top director in the business. I remember she told me that. Top uh-huh. director in the business. His movies are like mainstream movies. And we want to cut compilations. Would you like to cut them? And here's what we'll pay. Well, you know, I was kind of a starving documentary filmmaker. So I said, mm-hmm. sure, sure. So she sent a bunch of movies over. They sent a list of the scenes I was supposed to pull out. I started working. And I got into one movie. And right in the middle of the movie... PT is so it's people having sex on a stair on a staircase and at the top of the stairs PT as the director peeks around the corner and is watching the scene and the editor that had cut the movie didn't catch that and I'm looking at it and I thought holy hell how could you not see the director right in the top of the shot so I called her and I said "Um, didn't you tell me you're like the biggest company in the business oh we are I said, didn't you tell me that this guy, Paul Thomas, his stuff is like the best stuff out there? She goes, it is. I said, well, I'm (laughs) sitting here watching a scene and he's in the scene at the watching, you know, and your editor wasn't bright enough to cut it out. He's right at the top of the frame. She goes, that's impossible. I said, I'm looking at it. I'm telling you it's total amateur hour. (laughs) And she said to me, oh, you think you could do better? And I said, yeah, I think I could do better than have the director in the shot. Yeah, I think I could do better than that. She goes, oh, why don't you come in and try to direct a movie for us? I said, And so I, as a documentary filmmaker and a journalist, my nature was to always jump down every rabbit hole that I found. I'm like, well, that should be interesting. Direct. I never even seen a porn other than cutting these compilations. Wow, really? I never watched a porn. How old were you at this point? Uh, I was like 23. Oh, no, no, I was older than that. I was probably 27 at that point. And I was like, yeah, okay, sure. So uh, she said, all right, we'll come into the offices. I came in, I met Steven, the owner of the company. And uh, they gave me a movie to direct, which would turn out to be the biggest movie of the year. Had nothing to do with me directing it, by the way. It had everything to do with who was in it. It was called Blondage, and it was with Janine and uh, Julia Ann, who were two huge stars at the time. Uh Uh-huh. But Steven, because his personality is to be some, like, like Russ Hampshire was always, I think, fairly sarcastic and cynical about creatives, creative people. Steven was always a little in fear. I think this is my estimation. Steven would probably deny it when you talk to him. But I think Steven was a little intimidated by creatives because he didn't understand them at all. Steven's a real analytic, you know, he's very, you know, like, yeah. But he was, I think he was a little intimidated because I saw him intimidated by PT. So he didn't, he was intimidated by PT because PT always pulled the I'm a creative genius card on him. (laughs) And so I came in and uh, I think he just didn't know what to make of me. And I was mainstream, which I think appealed to him. So he put me under contract. I was under contract to Vivid for seven years. And that was my first big deal. I mean, I did a couple of other things for other people. I did this crazy movie for, remember Gabor Zabo? I know you, you remember Gabor. Oh, of course, yeah. Of course. Oh, I thought it was, the movie was Gabor Zawa. No. I, forget, I don't know his last name, but now I know his last name. I did a movie. Hungarian. With, yeah, yeah. yeah cra- I did a crazy film for Gabor, but uh, but I, for the most part, I was with Vivid for seven years, and I learned my trade. I learned the business. I learned so much from Steven. I learned the business from Steven. Uh, I shot on film, which I love. That's one of the reasons I took the gig because they were shooting on 16 millimeter at the time. So Blondage was 16 millimeter? Blond- they were shooting a mix. They were shooting video and film. Blondage was video, but I would, my contract would be, um, I think it was for five movies a month and it was three videos and two films. And I loved shooting film. I, I found it really interesting. I was total old school at those days, you the, know. The documentary, that's on video, right? Uh, porn in the, yeah, it was called Porn in the USA was the documentary I shot. Uh, so, so I did a documentary, uh, because I was now in this world a little bit. No, I mean the documentaries from, from the, Central America. Absolutely. They were yeah, film. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. They were video. video. They were video. 
I had never shot film until I got into adult. So being an adult, that was the document. That was the third documentary I did for Australian Broadcasting. And it was called Porn in the USA because Bruce Springsteen, I think, had just come out with Born in the USA. So we did a parody on that. And um, so I would do that for many years, uh, be under contract to direct feature for Vivid. But I also then... I was fascinated by the business and I was fascinated by the people in it. And remember, I was a real liberal, an uber liberal progressive. And all of my friends were, you know, radical feminists and they were horrified that I was shooting pornography. But you know what? I still to this day, 25 years later or however long it is, still believe, uh, as a matter of fact, jumping ahead, Marcy and I just started a company and it's called Disruptive Propaganda because I believe that pornography is the most disruptive political propaganda there is. It just, it upsets and turns on its head everything that's out there from religion to politics to, you know, the conventions of society, right? And that's what I saw in it. I saw women, not that were necessarily um, victimized, although there there have been women in the business that have been victimized, no, no doubt, but I saw a lot of women that were really empowered and <clears throat> very much in control of their bodies and making their choices and happy to make their choices. And I found that fascinating. I found it, I found the women in this business to be the most liberated women that there were because they had decided this is what they wanted to do and they didn't really care whether you liked it or you didn't. Um, it was their choice and they were social renegades, which I liked. And so I started doing... You're a social renegade a little bit? Yeah, I always was. Always was? I always was. So you could relate? I could always relate to I, that. I'm, st- I'm very curious about the Central America situation. Yeah. Because um, Bush grabbed his buddy, <laughs> Manuel Noriega, right? Yeah. Were they buddies or something? Uh, I think that they were strategic allies for a very long time because Noriega was deep into the drug smuggling. Uh-huh. I mean, he was a key... That was a big... Uh, 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 takeoff point for the planes and the shipments that were coming up from Colombia, right? So the cocaine is coming up from Colombia and landing in Panama. Panama is then, you know, charging the CIA and the government an enormous amount of money or taking a big cut of the drugs to allow that to be the transit point. And then from, from Panama, some of it's going to Costa Rica, which is the next country over. And then from there, they're jumping it into, into the United States, usually into airfields in the middle of the deserts of, of California. And they were smuggling in so much cocaine. J- jumping it? Like it, parachuting it in? No, they were jumping it, but they were flying it in. Okay. And they were landing at these, you know, like, go, go check out Trona, which is a ghost town up around Ridgecrest there's a little there's airfields up there I okay. think they were probably landing in places like Trona I don't know that Fox they Field or some small yeah, little place some some off the wall tiny little place where they could pay off the guy that was the caretaker and they were bringing in these massive loads of drugs and then they were ringing so much cocaine that they couldn't I mean the prices on the street were just dropping and they couldn't get enough cocaine distributed across the United States so then they had to come up with crack which was they were taking coke, boiling it down, obviously, into rock, and they introduced it into South Central. And that's where the the crack epidemic started, was in South Central L.A. So who do you think invented the idea of crack? Or, you know, rock? Uh, I don't know if it was... I don't know if it was the guys in Colombia who were trying to figure out a way to to sell more cocaine because they were harvesting harvesting so much of it, and they said, "Hey, we know a way you can you can actually distill this, and it's much more addictive." And because obviously they create their market then, or if it was you know some some guy in a lab at, in Langley, you know, <laughs> or huh. or you know someplace in Virginia. I don't know who actually created it, yeah. but somebody had the bright idea. Yeah. This is what we need to do because we've got we're swimming in cocaine right now. We can't sell enough of it to 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 make money to fund our black box operations in Central America. I mean, Ironic, billions of dollars. Ironically, I watched a little documentary last night on Netflix mm-hmm. about the real narcos, mm-hmm. you know, from Mexico. You know, because mm-hmm. they after Colombia, you know, after um, Escobar, Escobar, Pablo Escobar, mm-hmm. I guess they figured the best way to get it smuggled in, the mm-hmm. Mexicans, right? Mm-hmm. So they're the masters of smuggling these days into mm-hmm. the States. Mm-hmm. So they're 
their operation is so big, you must know, you know, it's humongous. But they're the ones smuggling the most cocaine from from them. Because yeah. it goes from Colombia to Mexico and then boom. I yeah. guess that's the way it goes right now. Yeah, right now. Unless you have, if you, if you don't have the CIA to just fly it in for you, then yeah, you have to yeah. bring it in across the border. Or, you know, they had submarines. Oh, yeah, they, they still were, have submarines. Yeah. So uh, actually, when I was at Penthouse, we did a whole article on a on a guy that got busted submarine that was coming in, and the the, the captain got busted. And yeah, it's a whole big thing. So yeah, um, yeah so um, yeah, I was always um, I was always not normal. I will just say, <laughs> Are you scared any time? You know, because you're in the middle of a no, no. Um, no scared well yeah i suppose i was i did a re- very foolish drive one night from guatemala city to a place on the mexican border uh, a little town called quetzaltenango and it was a stupid i i was i was stubborn people everybody told me i shouldn't go but i wanted to get there the next day to cover a story and no, none of the other journalists were going to go and it was i, I remember about three o'clock in the morning in thick fog you couldn't even see like you couldn't see in front of your headlights. You could see your headlights just bouncing back and on this tiny mountain road, just thinking there's every reason in the world I should get killed tonight. But, um, but yeah, I was scared occasionally, but more often than not, uh, you're just running on adrenaline, you know? And, and that's the other thing is you get very addicted to adrenaline. It is a very addictive drug. So when I got back here, I understand now why people in the military count the days until they're out but once they're out and they're back here two months later they re-enlist and go back because you just you know being back here is like a dream it's like sleepwalking after you're addicted to adrenaline you're addicted to living on the edge all the time so it took a while to sort of step down off of that i almost went i was scheduled to go with a crew on the first kuwaiti invasion right in the middle east uh, 1991? And, yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, it was about that time because about the time I was getting, it was right before I got into adult. But um, the last minute they found a guy that spoke Farsi and I guess they thought that was safer than taking a five foot eleven redhead. You <laughs> 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 stand I mean, out. Great target, you know, and I didn't speak Farsi. So at the last minute, and it was funny because it was all very clandestine. At that time, it was before cell phones. I mean, I actually remember... I don't know if you remember when you, if you wanted to make a call, you had to fish a quarter out of your pocket and go to a 7-Eleven and stand at a phone booth where some homeless guy had peed and, you know, pick the phone up and put the quarter in, uh, you know, and talk. It's yeah. crazy times. Can't, I can hardly believe that we ever had to do that, but we did. And I remember someone, the actually the woman that did the documentary called Cover Up Behind the Iran-Contra Hearing. So I remember her calling me at my office and saying, can you go to a pay phone? I was like, yeah. And she goes, and call me at this number. I'm like, okay. <laughs> but you're excited. I, 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 I go to, yeah, I go to a pay phone. I call her, I go, what's up? She goes, you got a passport? <laughs> I said, yeah, of course I have a passport. She said, can you be at the airport at 11 o'clock tonight? I was like, yeah, where am I going? <laughs> and she said, you're going to fly into Jordan, and then you're going to cross from, from the capital of Jordan over to uh, uh, the Kuwaiti-Iraqi border uh with um who was this guy he was a secretary of ramsey clark was his name he had been the secretary of state for um uh jimmy carter and then he said ramsey clark's going in they're going to document civilian casualties and he needs to take a camera person i'm like i'm all over it and uh i went back i started packing and then she calls me again she goes can you go to a payphone i was like again (laughs) and she said uh they're going to go with a guy out of uh, jordan that can speak farsi and i went damn it and then i had a second request because there were so many people going to cover that war and at the time it wasn't like they had a lot of uh on the ground people in those territories to cover things so the big networks would send in crews cbs was sending in i don't know five or ten crews or something got another call from a different source saying there's a woman producer and she wants to take a woman camera person can you go and i was like yeah i'm all over it that's like five or six days later and she said you'll have to go to virginia because they were embedding i don't know if you remember this when they were embedding crews with the units with the u.s military units well you have to go to 
Virginia and you got to go through, you know, I don't know, some orientation for two days and then, and then they'll ship you out with a particular division. I'm like, okay. And then I get a call back that the woman's husband, because she had a child and she was married and her husband just said, too dangerous, don't go. It was kind of a drag. I missed it. But I did cover, when I got back, I did cover something, uh, which was interesting. At that time, there was a huge, uh, down in the Rampart District, for people who are listening that don't know, it's kind of a dodgy part of town that's close to downtown. I used, I used to hang on that hood yeah. a little bit back Tommy's. in 91, 92, Tommy's 93. On Rampart and uh, Alvarado and Alvarado. Olympic. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so Jake Steeds thing out down there. There was the uh, Rampart District cops, and they had a thing called the Crash Unit, which was the gang unit. And there were two gangs down there, and they were Salvadorian gangs. There was the Mara Salvatrucha, which meant uh, um, Mara is like the sea, and the Salvatrucha are like the fish that swim in the sea. So they're like the the gang guys that are in the neighborhood that are just always moving. And then there was the 18th Street Tray. Trey being the card, the, the tray on the cards, the club. And, uh, and then there was the gang unit who was, who they were going out. They were a bunch of tough guys and they were going out picking up 15 year olds in the street at two in the morning and beating the hell out of them in, in alleys. And I mean, it was a big mess. There was, there were no angels involved there. So I go down, uh, what was the name of the stock? Do you know what that place looked like at night times? Right on the south side of Olympic, um, trying to think. near Alvarado, a little yeah, bit, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. a little bit west of Alvarado, and south of Olympic. Yeah, they had some apartments over there. Yeah, right. And this place was was crazy. They had a hundred guys mm-hmm. all the time yeah. working the streets. Yeah, not getting you know the El Salvadorans who you're saying all the yeah, Latins. Yeah, yeah. They were out there slinging drugs all the time. You know, we, me and my, me and Jake are always looking for girls. You know, we mm-hmm. like the girls. So we drive. I say, what the hell? And then you see the people. Like, so you know, they're selling drugs. But it was like crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. So that's the time. Yeah, and and though they had their turf, and you didn't cross. You know, 18th Street tra- trade didn't cross to MSA, and MSA didn't cross the other side. And then you had the crash unit that was just like trying to shoot everybody. So, so I go to do this documentary and uh, on the gang crisis down there, and. Uh, one day I would be on a ride along with the cops, Lieutenant Jack Hoare. That was his name. H O A R. Stage Jack name. Hoare. No, no, wow. that was his real name, Jack Hoare. And he was a Vietnam vet. And then his huh. his um, second in command was this. And he was a big man. And his second was this little guy named Mikey. And they would just. And, and they hated the press. They hated me. Oh, I know what it was. I was not covering necessarily the gangs. I think this is when I was doing the, the documentary on guns. And they hated me. So they would put me in the back seat of their car, which was has plastic seats because they're used to having, you know, perps in the back seat who are throwing up and peeing and stuff. So they put me in the back seat and then they would drive up and down the streets of the Rampart District going like 90 miles an hour. And I'd just be sliding with my camera from taking turns at 60 miles an hour. I'd be sliding from one side to the other. And they thought it was so hilarious. <laughs> it was a little funny. <laughs> and then the next day, I would be out with Mara Salvatrucha, and they would be like, yo, Esa, you were with the police yesterday. You were with the cop. They were with the pigs. You were with the pigs yesterday. I said, you know, I'm covering it's a documentary. I got to be, I got to talk to everybody. Yo, those guys are not good, man. They're dangerous. You should not be with I'm with Mara Salvatrucha in the street at three in the morning. They're like, Yo, those guys are dangerous. You should not be with them. And I'm like, yeah, I know, whatever, you know. They, they're not going to do anything. Then the next night, I'd be with 18th Street Trey. They'd be like, yo, girl, we saw you with MSA. You get killed out there with that. I said, no, 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 no. You're not going to. Sh-. I said, why? Are you going to shoot me? No, no, we're not going to shoot you. But, you know, it's dangerous out there. You should. So every. And then the next night, I'd be back with the cops. And they'd be like, were you out with the gangs last night? <laughs> I'm like, dude, I'm working on a documentary, okay? But it was hilarious. So if you were with them, you were fine. But, you know, it, would oh, be like, it was pretty funny. It was pretty were the funny. gangsters nicer than the police? Yeah. It sounds by like far, it. By far. By yeah, far. More, more heart? More. By far. Oh, that's, yeah. see, that's, that's, that's why I'm a renegade. Yeah, yeah right? I mean, because yeah. all the idea of properness and etiquette and the people in charge are full of uh, bullshit. And let me ask you this. 
Have you ever de- you've dealt with mainstream Hollywood here? Not Have you really. ever dealt with mainstream Hollywood? Really. Well, let me tell you what you will find if you ever do de- deal with mainstream Hollywood. For all of the dysfunction and craziness in this business, you get involved in mainstream Hollywood, they will put a knife in your back faster than anything. Here, people think we're a little crazy or they think we're a little, I don't know, sketchy. No, there's actually this kind of camaraderie and this, uh, you know, honor amongst thieves type of thing that goes on here. <laughs> You will not find that out in the mainstream Hollywood world. They would cut your throat. They'll throw you under a bus. They'll do whatever they need to do if they can can somehow get an advantage on you or take your job. So that's one of the reasons. I mean, there's a lot of reasons I never left to go back to doing mainstream. But one of the big reasons was this is just as dysfunctional as it is. It was a community. And I felt that this was a community that ultimately had more honor about it than than mainstream. I mean, it's dysfunctional with the idea of the perpetrators out there, yeah. right, who are full of shit. Yes, So exactly. it makes you wonder, right? Yeah, exactly. Who's really dysfunctional? Yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. And also, you know, all the, you know, now people, because we've had a lot of girls that have died, some suicides, some just accidental overdose, and people are like, oh, what is it about? Oh, these poor porn girls, what is it about? And I'm like, dude. It's opioids. Everybody's dying. It's not just the girls here. Everybody, you know, the girls in the suburbs, the girls in Beverly Hills, they all, you know, start taking Xanax and they're drinking a little too much and they take two more Xanax and they just don't wake up. That's the truth of it. It's tragic. I mean, I just had Jessica James's memorial service at the ranch two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And I don't think Jessica meant to kill herself because she would have left a note because she's dramatic. She would have left a note. I just think she drank a little bit too much and took a couple, one too many pills, and, you know, went to sleep and didn't wake up. But uh, everything that afflicts the general population obviously touches us and vice versa. The things that go on here, you see it in the general population, no matter what it is. Yeah. You know? The opioids are really pretty ugly out there. It's pretty days. ugly. And, you know, uh, we have weirdness on set here and, and the mainstream has uh, Weinstein, Harvey Weinstein. Huh. It all happens. I mean, it happens across the board and that's with everything. The technology changes that happen in mainstream happen to us. So, and vice versa. So, yeah. you know, there is no, there's no, there's nothing that's particular and specific to this industry in terms of cultural issues. Did you make any money doing your documentaries? You said no. you were starving. No, didn't make, no, didn't make a cent. I had to do a lot of other work to support my bad documentary habits because at that time, I'll tell you a a story that makes the point. The same woman that I worked with that did cover up behind the Iran-Contra hearings never got it aired in the United States. Four years later, PBS would do a frontline special about the Iran-Contra thing and call it breaking story. It's a breaking story. Are you joking? It's old news. We did this four years ago. Story over by now. Thanks. Because PBS gets funding from the government. Uh, She also did, and I was less involved in this one, but she did, I was mildly involved in this one. She did a documentary called Panama Invasion. Remember when the U.S. invaded Panama to get rid of Noriega? Yeah, of course. That's what I was mentioning before. They didn't need him talking about the fact that he had been orchestrating their drug deals, and I think he was threatening to do that. So she did a thing called uh, Panama, oh, it's called Panama Deception. Um, it was about the invasion of Panama and how the whole thing was bullshit. And um, it won the Academy Award that year. But guess what? It never aired in the United States. Wow. How'd they receive it? Because it was only, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, they, I mean, the Academy, it ran in some theaters for five days to qualify for an Academy Award. And then it got submitted to the to the committee. But it never aired at that time. There was no... I don't know if CNN was around, but there wasn't a lot of outlets for documentary. There was just PBS, and it never aired on PBS. It aired in Europe. A lot of my documentaries aired in Europe. It aired in Latin America, but never aired in the United States. I don't know to this day that Panama Deceptions ever aired in the United States. So, yeah, was I starving to answer your question? Absolutely. I never made a dime off of my documentaries. 
Um, documentaries were not as popular back then. You didn't have ca- all the cable outlets like Netflix. You know, Netflix is like now to do a documentary. I mean, it's a wonderful world out there. There's lots of opportunities. Um, there's whole whole channel streaming on, on the streaming services that are just documentary channels. But at the time, I remember the last documentary I started to do, uh, Michael Moore would, had just done Roger and Me, and Michael Moore um, actually was an anonymous anonymous donor I knew who, who donated the money but he was kind of an anonymous donor to my documentary because it was that he was just starting to be successful um so I my post-production facility did a lot of stuff we did you know pick it worker safety videos for Ralph's supermarket uh training videos for promotional videos for Isuzu Motors I'm just thinking about who we actually worked with Transamerica insurance safety I mean we did all kinds of industrial stuff and commercials and music videos we did everything we could to you shot a living it? yeah okay yeah. you shot and directed all that I shot I directed um sometimes I would just direct and have shooters sometimes I was the shooter but uh that's why when adult came along and marcy wanted me to start editing i was like and we did a lot of post-production and i was like oh yeah great another revenue source and then when she said do you want to direct and uh she told me what they were going to pay me which i think was yeah what was that you know, i think it was two days of a shoot and i think i was getting like 2500 a day or something that was back in the day and then when they gave me a contract for five movies obviously it was you know i was bank i was making bank but i'll tell you what i really thought made- yeah, I was probably making five thousand dollars a movie. So, I'll tell you what I really made bank. Oh, well, I'm going to tell you a side story about that though. So I started shooting, and my budgets were thirty five thousand dollars on the film stuff. The videos I think were like twenty two five or something. Well, before we go too far, I want to say, so the editees they said for you to edit, right? Mm-hmm. So they were they willing to pay more money for the editing than the other people were paying? Yeah. Like yeah. how much more? A hundred percent more? Or? Uh, I don't know if we rented it out by the day or we did it by the project. I remember the first big project I did was for PT, and it was a movie called Masseuse Two. And uh, Masseuse Two, okay. Masseuse Two. So his big movie was Masseuse, and uh-huh. then they did a sequel to it, Masseuse Two. And he came in. I hadn't met him. It was the first time I ever met him. And he, I lived in Burbank, and I had a basement of all things, and that's where my edit base were. And so he came in to watch the cut. And I guess he thought he was going to flip me out because he said he walks in and he sits down and he goes, "Okay," and he goes, "Wait a minute, do you have some? You have like some Kleenex or paper towel?" And I went, "Oh, I'm sorry. Did I? Is something spilled back there?" He goes, "No, I'm going to jerk off." He goes, "If I don't jerk off, if I can't come watching a movie, it's not good." And I just went, "Okay, then. Well, I'll just leave you to it." <laughs> <laughs> it's like, great. I've never had a client say that before. It's crazy. And uh, so uh, I think, I don't remember what they paid. Maybe twenty five, maybe 5000 I don't remember what they paid back then, but it was significant. For the editing for the film. For the editing of the film. Uh, but, film. you know, we were doing hard and soft, so uh-huh. it, was, it, was a bit, it was like weeks-long process. Is it harder to edit the film because this film is different than video? No, no you just uh-huh. go, you take, the, you take the video and you get it transferred I mean, you take the film after it's been processed and you go through a process called telecine and you get it transferred to video and then you're cutting in video just okay. the way you would cut. In Avid. Video. You had an Avid system? I had an Avid at that time and then I, I would ultimately move to Final Cut Pro, but yeah, I had an Avid at the time. Which was like 30, 40,000 back then? Or yeah, a lot, which I think probably a year later it had dropped to like 6,000, right? It was completely <laughs> obsolete. Final Cut destroyed and it. I had a great thing called, a, do you remember a, an Amiga toaster? Does anybody remember an Amiga toaster? Uh, it was a sweet Witcher. It was hilarious. Everybody had them back in the day. They were the bomb. But um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, but I remember PT, after I started shooting film, I remember he called me and he was really outraged. And he said, I heard what your budget was. It's 35000 a movie. And I'm like, yeah. He goes, I charge them $70,000. you are making me look bad. He goes, you need to raise your budget. I said, well, it's a little late for that. I already like gave them like, a line item budget. They wow. Because I told them the real costs. I'm like, this is what film costs. This is what processing costs. And they'd never seen it before because PT had been padding it the whole so time. So you were telling me that yeah, so he didn't PT like might have been paying 35000 for a movie? No. Uh, I was, Vivid was paying me 35000 But yeah, PT, because that's what it cost. Yeah. PT was doing bigger movies than me. So let's say his budget was should have been maybe, I don't know, 50000 
but I think he was charging him 70 or 80. So I busted him, but I didn't mean to. I didn't know I was busting him, but I busted him because I gave him a real budget. And all of a sudden, Stephen was like, PT, come into my office. You know? <laughs> and he's like, you got to raise your budgets. I said, it's too late for that. They know what my numbers are. Uh, I'm just like, what do you think? I'm an idiot. I mean, I can't go in there and raise it. So, PT, don't understand where the hell you just came from. Yeah. yeah. I mean, down in Central America with cocaine and yeah. killers. Plus documentaries that lose money. I mean, you know how to make every dollar count because you're, you're basically yeah. financing your own stuff. Yeah, so you used so. to fly down there with your own money? Yeah. Well, we would raise money. So, um, uh, you know, at that time, there was a lot of resistance to Reagan's dirty wars, as they were called. Was that Reagan or was that Bush? I was Reagan at the time. I was started in during the Reagan era. No, but I wonder. And then it, it trans. Oh, who was pushing? Is the that wars? really Bush? Because he was, owned the yeah. DEA or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was probably Bush behind it all. You know, Papa Bush, I think, had been head of the CIA or something, if I remember. And so being in, in L.A., you know, it was advocacy pieces, really. And so I would go do fundraisers, you know. I'd go to people's houses and show part of the movie and say, I need to raise another $10,000 to go down again. And that's kind of how it went. Or I would do mainstream work through my company, Art Attack. Mainstream Art work. Attack. It's called Art Attack. That's the company name. Well, because you know that there was a... Graphic artist coming in. Yes, Art Attack. he used to get calls from me. That's interesting. You remember that? His name oh, was Kenny. Kenny and Paul. Yeah, and Terry. Yeah, because they did probably a thousand of my covers. Uh, yeah, so I'd get calls from them, and they get calls from they. they people call me <laughs> That's and crazy. like, uh, "Hey, who's Kenny?" And I'm like, "No, other Art Attack." The corporate name of my company was called Riv Video, and it was short for Revolutionary Video. But then the DBA was called Art Attack. And um, so we would do a lot of mainstream work just to kind of support my bad documentary habit. So did you ever do any cocaine out there? No. No? No. no. I'll but I will tell you uh, another kind of parallel funny story about crack is we had offices on La Brea, no, on Pico right off of La Brea at what? one point. Uh, documentary offices. That's what? Yeah, it's a stiff part of town, right? Well, what you have is, in those days, Washington, mm -hmm. right next door, is where it's really going down. Mm -hmm. Washington, La Brea, and down to Redondo, mm -hmm. right there, is going down. Yeah. Dangerous and, you know, guns and everything. So, again, I'm in this little, um, it's like a little one-story office complex that had all these little offices. And the office next to me was the local crack dealer. And he would, he, I think he had an apartment or something, but, but he was there all the time. And I had six or eight weeks to raise a bunch of money to go down to Central America to do this documentary. And so I was working around the clock, sending out, you know, emails and solicitations and doing presentations. And I was there from probably 10 or 11 in the morning to 2, 3 in the, in the morning, night after night after night. So he... And everybody in the building, I think, knew he was the crack dealer. So, and he was running a whole crew out on the street. So he'd come over to me and he'd be like, yo, why are you working so late? This is about, I'm like, dude, I got to. And he said, so what are you doing? And we told him about Central America and he didn't really know much about it. And I said, well, how about Soweto? You know, you know what's going on in South Africa? Because he was black. And he goes, oh yeah, I know it. I said, there was a song, a famous kind of progressive song at the time that said the blood of Soweto runs down the rivers, runs through the rivers of Nicaragua. And I played him that song and I, you know, I, I did my progressive stuff. I said, it's, it's a global struggle. It's a struggle for people who are trying to, you know, have a better life and whether it's Soweto or it's Managua, it's all the same struggle. So then I was like his best friend. So he goes, Oh, I got it. I got it. So uh, he would uh, say, listen, you need to tell me when you're leaving at night, you know, so nothing happens to you out there. So I literally parked at the back of this building in a parking lot that didn't have lights, but he had put the word out to everybody. So I would go out at two or three o'clock in the morning and from the bushes, you'd hear people go, yo, Kelly, what are you doing? How come you didn't work so late? I'm like, hey, I never knew what their names were. I'm like, hey, you know, I just got to, when you going, where are you going? I'm like, I'm going to, to El Salvador. 
wow, when are you going down there? I said, well, three weeks. I got to get my stuff together, you know. I got to raise some money. Ah, well, you be careful out here. I got my eye on you now. I'm not going to let anything happen. Every night there was some crack dealer in the bushes that was paying attention so that nothing would happen to me. So, once wow. again, same thing as, as the gang kids. It's just a matter of whose posse you're in, you know, whose right. squad you're a part of. What size so, you're on. Yeah, yeah. So, that's really nice. So they, it seems to me like you might have a little of an angel watching over you. Well, I was raised Catholic. I was telling Marcy, because it was Yom, Yom Kippur not too long ago, and she was talking about in the Jewish culture, you know, this is when the book is written for whether you can make it through the next year because you have to atone for all of your sins of the prior year. And I said, that's a good tradition. I said, we had a better one. And it was called All Saints Day. It happened on the same day as, or the day after uh, Halloween or the same day or something. And on All Saints Day, you went into church and every rosary that you pr- that you prayed, full rosary, you would pray one soul out of purgatory and into heaven, and then that that soul had to watch out for you. So I'm kind of I'm like I like that kind of concept, that analytical kind of concept. So I would like I'd be in there early in the morning praying till the end of the day because I'm like I want a whole squad of angels watching out for me. So every year I'd be praying, you know, twenty souls out of purgatory. So maybe I do, maybe yeah, I do. I so. I've had a bunch of near misses, believe me. I've been pretty close, but. Uh, I always squeak through, so maybe that's all the angels, all the people I prayed out of purgatory back in the day. Did you have machine gun fire go by it next year? Yeah, I mean, uh, you learn very early on that you just don't want to get caught between two sides. That's the big deal. You know, you're going to pick a side. Either you're going to be with the military and you're going to be behind them, or you're going to be with the rebels and you're going to be behind them. Um, I got through just a berserk set of circumstances, I got left in a village in the middle of nowhere that was deserted because a thousand people had been slaughtered there. And I frankly fell asleep on a bag of rice in this village and woke up and all of my friends had left because they didn't know where I was. And I'm like, uh, where am I? I was in this village with a thousand little white crosses in it for to mark the thousand people that had been slaughtered by the military. And it was in the middle of nowhere. And I was like, what? And these two little rebels come walking out of the jungles. And they stop and they look at me and they go, oh, tu estas en rubia. You're the redhead. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. And they said, oh, everybody's been looking for you. Where were you? I said, I, I, I just like laid down over there for 10 minutes to take a nap. And that was like six hours ago. They just kind of shake their heads. And little guys with these, they're probably 16 with these huge backpacks and these guns. And they're like, I said, they said, well, how are you going to get home? Back to the refugee camp, which is where we were based out of. I said, I don't know. I guess I'm just going to walk that way. That's the way I came. They said, you can't do that. The military's out there. They'll kill you. They find you out here by yourself. They'll kill you. So I had to follow them. I'll tell you this story because it's funny. So they said, come on, we'll take you to the refugee camp. We have a back way because they would come and go for supplies. So we start walking. They're carrying these huge backpacks. Now, I had come in a Land Rover, and I was wearing cowboy boots. I was not prepared to walk like six miles back to the refugee camp. But I had not planned on doing that. So I had come in a Land Cruiser or Land Rover with a briefcase and some cowboy boots. So here I am in the middle of nowhere. These kids are in camouflage with these massive backpacks. And I'm carrying my briefcase and my cowboy boots, like a dope. Walking through this nice field, the sun's up. It's beautiful, you know, it's really pastoral. And then it goes into the jungles, and now it's cooler, and it's kind of damp. And But we're walking, and it's great. And then the, the ground starts to kind of go up and down, gentle little hills. It gets a little bit steeper, and all of a sudden I take a step with cowboy boots who have, you know, slanted heels, and I just go bam, fall right on my ass. And they like turn around. Oh my God. They come back. They help me up. They get my, you know, briefcase. And I'm like, oh my God. They said, no, 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 no. Caminando con poquito steps, like little steps. Okay, fine. I Now I'm walking little steps. I get maybe another five minutes on. Bam, I slide again. They just look at me and they kind of shake their head. They go, okay, 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 okay. No, I have a problem with Kelly. Sideways, little steps, sideways. Sideways, I fall. Other side, I fall. Try taking big steps, I fall. Finally, they're way up in front of me because they're just sick of me now. Because it's like, oh man, we didn't plan on this. 
and I can hear them way up in front of me, but I can kind of see the trail and I'm falling and sliding and slipping and I'm covered in mud and my hair's covered in mud and I, I was a mess. And I hear one of them say in Spanish to the other one, Where, hey, where's the Rubia? <laughs> and the other one says, oh, she's back there. I heard her fall a minute ago. <laughs> And I finally got back and I had to literally climb up the side of this hill with like tree roots and shit. And I come up to the top and I come flat into the bottom of a, of a structure. And I'm like, now where am I? Throw my briefcase up there, scramble up. Literally, I'm like crawling on my stomach. I'm exhausted. I get up and I realize I'm at the kitchen of the refugee camp, which is where we're staying. And I'm like, holy shit, they had a back route all this while. This is one of their little hidden back um, like a movie. trails into the jungle. And I limp in. I'm literally covered in mud. I look like a mud creature. And I open the door and all the journalists I know, the journalists from the BBC, the journalists from Italy, the journalists from, you know, CBS, everybody's sitting there eating breakfast and they just look up at me uh. and they all just go, start clapping and laughing because they all knew by this time the word had come back on what had happened and they were just like, come on in. <laughs> what did your family think about all this? Wild- my mom used to say to me, it's only my mom, and my mom used to say to me every time I was going out of town she to Central America, she'd say, oh my God, it's so dangerous. And I would say, mom, I live in L.A., It's a war zone. (laughs) You know, it's just one we know about. It's one we understand. But, you know, and it's true. In L.A., I said in L.A., if I got shot, it would be random. In Central America, if I get shot, if I got shot, there'd be a reason for it. You know, somebody will put out the order on it. But All right. So So you weren't going to get shot because you weren't doing anything. Yeah, well, I was. I was. But at that time, at that time, and it's very different now in in, uh, the Middle East. Journalists are targeted, but at that time they didn't want to. Sh- they were fine to shoot Dutch journalists. I had a friend from Holland that was killed. Um, they were fine to shoot Italian journalists. They didn't care about that, but they did not want to shoot American journalists because their money was coming from the U.S. And the last thing they needed was bad press in the U- in the U.S. You know, the nuns had been killed down there several years earlier. American nuns had been killed. Wow. Archbishop Romero had been shot. So the last thing they wanted was a high profile you know, scandal, which would then just increase the anti-war sentiment in the United States. They, if you got killed, you would be either because you totally blundered into something that you just didn't know how to handle, and it was an accident, you were stupid. Kind of now like going to Mexico. Everybody's so freaked out to go to Mexico. I go to Mexico all the time. I love Mexico. I love Rosarita Beach. And um, everybody's like, oh, oh my God, it's so dangerous. I'm like, it's not dangerous. They rely on tourism. Your only reason you're going to get shot is if you happen to accidentally steal someone's drugs or screw somebody's, you know, cartel friend or something goes wrong. It's not going to happen. Just rare that it would happen by accident. So, you know, but it's different. It's different in the Middle East. Now you're targeted many times. So you really have to be careful. Scary. Yeah. They don't want journalists out there. No. So I don't want American journalists for sure. Oh, really? Well, it depends on where you are, but, you know, I wouldn't go tromping around Afghanistan right now if I had the options. Yeah. You, I always thought, you know, this is kind of like it for the adult business, but still, I am curious because I always thought that they went to Afghanistan for the opium fields. Quite possible. Yeah. Quite possible. Because ironically, I was in the Golden Triangle in mm-hmm. 1999, mm-hmm. right? That's when... Clint was still there, but anyway, it's 99, and I'm going to go up there and smoke opium, right? Because I have the fantasy, you know, the Asian girls, the opium den. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting high, all that cool stuff. So me and my friend and my Uncle Harry mm-hmm. were up there, and I go, hey, you know, I'm good in the streets. So I'm saying, hey, where's the opium, right? <laughs> you DEA, you DEA. Because yeah. DEA is all over there. Yeah. They had stopped the trade. Yeah. They stopped the movie because that was the number one before in the world so that was strange to me seeing that they had stopped it or controlled it and let afghanistan flourish yeah. kind of right because they had 98 yeah. percent of the opium production in the world yeah so to me that was like then all of a sudden we're in afghanistan like, huh? and if you think about it opiates i think are more precious than oil mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right i mean mm-hmm. is it trillion dollar business worldwide what mm-hmm. is it Mm-hmm. Anyway, so 
I'm curious. I'm not even curious. It's pretty obvious. Yeah. I'm a good mathematician. Yeah. But <laughs> you're a good businessman too. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I'm all right. We know where the money is. <laughs> so yeah. So as, as they said during Watergate, follow the money. You want to know the story? Follow the money. Yeah. Always the, follow Nixon. the money. I saw Nixon in that one Michael Moore film. I thought right mm -hmm. when he was talking to Kaiser, mm -hmm. right? I mean, my great uncle was uh, real friendly with Nixon, mm -hmm. but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> another story for another day. Yeah. But where are you? Where were you born? Dallas. Oh. Dallas, Texas. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Dallas, that. Oh. Yeah. Trump's there tonight. Is he? Yeah. I hope somebody heckles him. I don't know what your politics are. I'm just not a Trump supporter. So. What nationality are you? Irish. It was Scottish, actually. By. By real origin, but my family then was ex was forcibly repatriated to Ireland, I think, in the 1500s or something. So, so Scottish Irish, pretty yeah. much pure blood. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. My real name is my my last name Holland is my stepfather's name. My father's my biological father's name is McRight, M C W R I G H T. And guess what? I n only saw him a couple of times in my life, but he was a very high ranking FBI official. He was head of the biological chemical warfare division. So mm. somebody dies at a, at a, uh, one of those things called those, uh, salad bar things. Uh, I don't remember what they are, but anyway, uh, somebody had tainted the, the, the lettuce at, uh, at some salad bar thing. It was a big deal and people got poisoned and died. And well, he was the guy investigating that or Legionnaire's disease. He was a big, and he was the guy behind the original investigations on Legionnaire's disease or the use of chemical weapons or the later politically, the use of biological weapons. It was your uncle. He was a bio, no, my father, your father He oh. was a biologist. He was actually a PhD. Uh, he had a PhD in biology and he taught biology at George Washington university in Washington. And then he was still to this day because you hold your credentials because he's passed away but he was professor emeritus at george washington and then was in the fbi and was a pretty high-ranking dude so that's here's a weird story i met him when i was in my 20s Whoa. and i had lunch with him and we were talking and i don't even know how it got brought up but he said uh i said something about el salvador and he said i was in el salvador I said, when were you in El Salvador? He said, like, 86. I went, get out. I was in El Salvador in 86. And I said to him, you must have stayed at the El Presidente Hotel. And he said, how did you know that? And I said, because that's where all the military and the CIA and the DEA stayed, was at El Presidente. I said, if I wanted to know something, I would just go drink in the bar at the El Presidente, and I'd hear everything that was going on. Really? And he oh. said, oh, well, yes, I did. He was a great guy, so I don't want to undermine that. But he said, well, yes, and I, I almost uh, was assassinated at the El Presidente. And I said, really? And he said, yes, somebody put a bomb under my bed. Now, and I said to him, well, I'm glad it didn't go off because if it had gone off, it probably would have been a friend of mine who actually who put it there and not knowing who you were. I didn't tell him because I didn't want to take his war story away that the Salvadorian government would tell every American official that they were almost assassinated by the rebels because uh, it would be like, oh, you were, oh, we broke up an, assass an assassination plot. You were almost blown up yesterday, uh, but we broke it up. And, oh, by the way, can we have another million dollars this this month for surveillance gear? And, and don't mind the guy that's hanging from the tree and we <laughs> castrated him and took his nuts off. Don't mind that torture because that's how we figured out that you were almost got assassinated. So telling American officials that they almost got killed kind of justified every ill that the uh, Salv Salvadoran military wanted to do. So that's, that's, it was an old that was an old joke, and I didn't bother to tell him that that was an old joke. But I just let him keep his story. So, but it's still some pretty heavy stuff. Yeah, I mean that's heavy duty. How weird is that though that we were both there? This is a guy that I had. I vaguely remember when I was one year old, him coming to say happy birthday to me because my mom split up when I was born, basically, because she was nutty. But um, Your mom was nutty? Yeah, she just has to part. He was in the Navy, and he had, she had postpartum depression, and she was just nuts, and they were Catholic, and she divorced him, and it was a, it was a thing. It was a thing for her, and it was a thing for him because he was Catholic. So I t it turned out that he had remarried and had three kids and they didn't know about me they did when i met him accidentally i, I called his son who had his same name because i was looking for him in the phone book and he was in arlington virginia obviously it's where all the cia fbi guys live and um 
I called Glenn McWright, and this guy answered. And I said, uh, hi, I'm, I'm trying to reach Glenn. I'm Glenn. Who's this? I said, oh, this is Kelly, your daughter by your first marriage. What? I was never <laughs> married. I, I don't have a daughter by... What are you... T-? And then there's a pause. He goes, are you looking for my father? And I said, uh, ooh, wow, maybe. He goes, well, he was never married before any either. And I said, you know, I'm just going to get off the phone now. But uh, he called his dad, and then it all kind of came tumbling out. I didn't mean for it to, but it did. Uh, Who would have thought? But anyway. Weird things happen. I mean, that was not even weird. It's kind of like... Weird things happen. Yeah. But, really weird things So happen. obviously, yeah, that's a weird thing, you know, running parallel with your father, the same Who you never country. met. Never Who's met. on the opposite side of the spec... Uh, on the uh, opposite, opposite side of the line. Too bad I didn't meet him in El Salvador. That would have been really true. Uh, walk by him. Maybe even walk by I him. I might have. I might, he might have been sitting in the El Presidente bar, and I didn't even know it. <laughs> right, you got some information off him. That would have been yeah. funny. Well, it proves one thing about that. It proves that both of you have really curiosity, curio- had curiosity in your minds. Yeah. Very curious people, right? Yeah, yeah. Because you want to find out what's going on. Yeah. He's FBI. That's their intelligence is to find out what's going on. Yeah. So you got it from him. Yeah. Right? If he had met Marcy Hirsch, he might have ended up being a director for porn. Really? She said, really? You think you know so much? You want to direct? <laughs> he was a, all right. So how, how was that when PT said, I'm going to jerk off, you just left? Was it, were you offended? No, I just thought it was the weirdest introduction in, in history. Actually, his first line to me was, he walked in. He said, do you have a bathroom? And I said, oh, yeah, it's, it's right through there. And uh, he came downstairs and he looked at me. He goes, there's nothing I like better than taking a big shit in the morning. And I just went, oh, okay, thanks for sharing. And then he said, do you have a box of Kleenex? I just thought, you know, I was, um, I was, I went to an all-girls school in Dallas. I was a little pristine and it wasn't pornography. It was just the sheer bad manners of it all, you know. And I know he did it just to see if he could shock me. So, at which then I was, of course, refusing to be shocked. I was just like, yeah, okay, yeah. whatever. <laughs> so he's, so. A, he's a little wild, huh? He's a, PT's a little wild, yes. <laughs> you know, what? I always bring this up. It's a old story now, but, you know, he has that one saying where he says, why do I even want to have sex unless I'm high? Mm-hmm. Which cracks me up every time I think about it, mm-hmm. you know? But, um, and you, all the famous stories of PT. And the yeah. hairbrush. Have you heard the hairbrush? Uh, tell me about that. Actually, next time you talk to Marcy, have Marcy tell you, because she was actually there, but it was AVN. And it's the famous story of PT being so high that he was out in the hallway of, like, I don't know, Bally's or whatever, whatever, you know, hotel they were at at the time, naked, high, with a hairbrush stuck up his bum. That's a famous uh, one. Out in the hotel? Yeah, in the hallway of the hotel. Oh, my God. Locked oh, the hallway of the hotel, so not... Yeah, all right. Well, the hallway that's on his floor. On his floor. Stuck out of his room because he let the do- door close behind him. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Right? <laughs> just think about, you're the couple from Kansas that just came for their nice vacation in <laughs> Vegas, and you walk out of your room and you see P.T. running around like a lunatic with a hairbrush coming out of his bum. He's a pretty good-sized dude, too. He's a big dude. Yeah. He's a big, tall dude. So when you were um, watching the sex, you didn't wa- you didn't see porn yet before. You know, you I've never seen porn. porn. I had to go. When she said, oh, you think you know so much you want to do a movie, I was like, yeah, sure. And then the minute I hung up, I was like, oh, my God, i got to watch a porn. And I saw one, the first movie. I don't even know how I got my hands on it. Where did I get it? I can't remember how I even got it, but it was a great movie. It was called Sin City the Movie. It was the first movie Sin City ever did. Really? And it had... It had Jamie Gillis in it. It had, uh, what was his name? Don? Remember the tall guy? Uh, tall guy, he was in every movie, played like Mr. He was like a Mr. Rogers character. And he was getting married to this, he married this girl. It was kind of like Rocky Horror Picture Show. And their car uh, breaks down in the middle. Uh, I remember what it's. But what, brown hair? I mean. Yeah, brown hair and. And, and muscular, and not muscular. Not muscular. He was thin and kind of goofy, but very tall. And I can't remember what his name was. Not my corner. Oh, I'm sorry, my corner. Not Don. My corner. Start my corner and some girl, and then they their car breaks down. They they end up. Jamie Gillis drives by and picks him up in a limo. And Jamie's as weird as Jamie is. 
and they take they go into this bar that's just you know little people and transsexuals and crazy things going on and of course they come to a whole new realization about their world anyway it was a very good movie it was well directed and it was brilliantly art directed and it was just crazy it was like a Fellini movie really and I was like oh okay I can do this <laughs> Jamie Gills was talented he was. Yeah, he was interesting. Yeah, he may have been the director for all I can remember, but uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, and then there were lots of roads that were converging converging at the same time. I had a documentary and I had to do some technical stuff with it, but I didn't have the equipment, and I got referred down to a place in Long Beach called Bondview, which was a bondage studio. So I met those guys kind of simultaneous to Marcy, and I also met Gabor simultaneous to Marcy. So it was coming at me from a lot of different directions, for, weirdly. I don't know why. And um, actually, Blondage was the first movie I directed. But I shot something f before that. And that, I don't even know how I got on that set. I just remember I met Ron Vogel, who looked at me and said, girls aren't supposed to shoot porn. I was like, who are you, old man? <laughs> and, it and he was, had redhead daughter, too. Fuck. And then it was Savannah when she was alive. It was oh, her movie. Really? And I did a lot of her scenes, yeah. And there was a scene. It was a three-way. It wasn't with her. It was another girl. I don't think it was with her. She was... There was a guy on the bottom. Mm, Alex, the guy with the long, curly, blonde hair, the real pretty guy, whatever his name was. I think I want to say his name was Alex something. Not Alex Metro, because that's... No, 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 he was short with black short hair. hair. No, this guy had long, flowing, blonde hair. It was a real Fabio-looking. I can't remember his name. But anyway, Alex Sanders. Alex Sanders. And then a girl was on top. And then there was a guy behind her, Tony Tedeschi. Maybe she was blowing him or something, and then Tony was behind her, doggy. And it was the first scene I ever shot. And I didn't know the kind of social protocol for shooting scenes. I thought, you know, you just don't want to interrupt him, right? You don't want to distract him and interrupt him. So I had this big beta cam, and I was sitting probably 30 feet back from the scene, sitting on the floor with the camera, like, trying to... I was zoomed in all the way so that it was, you know, kind of a... All three of them were in the shot. And I'm zoomed in trying to hold the camera steady. I just remember Tony, like... Tony, like, looks over me and goes, and I'm like, <laughs> really? Me? And he's like, so I kind of scoot in on my butt because I'm sitting on the floor. I scoot in a few feet, and he goes, get a little closer, get a little closer, until I'm literally underneath him. And I just remember, and he's fucking this girl doggy. He's got his leg up, and he looks down at me. He goes, if the sweat from my balls aren't falling in your face, you're not in the right spot. <laughs> Are you serious? He's that serious. That's what wow. he said to me. He, he, and then after the scene, he goes, you got to be tight to shoot this shit. You can't, it's not the news, you know. Wow. I was like, well, I didn't want to bother you. He goes, it's what we do for a living. You're not bothering us. Well, anyway. well that's what nice of him. You know, yeah. That was intelligent of him. Yeah. Yeah. What would you think of him as an actor or a performer? Uh, I thought he was great, but he was hard to shoot because he always had to pull his... his horse nuts? His horse nuts <laughs> up to see the shot. And I always felt bad. Uh, Tony... Could you just pull your ball sack up, please? Yeah. You know. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. I think I I worked with him a few times, of course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I saw so, that. Yeah, but that's real nice of him to do it. So that's interesting. You know. Yeah. yeah. Nobody told you what to do. You just said I'm a camera person. No. And they just said show up at this sound stage. I don't remember what sound stage it was, and I remember waiting for the scene to start. And Ron Vogel walked in, just looked at me, and what do, said, "What are you doing here?" I said, uh, uh, "I've been asked to come shoot the scene." He goes, "Girls can't shoot porn." I said, what is this, 1956? What are you, who are you, old man? You're lost like, in time. Yeah. Anyway, then we became good. Then after I, I finally shot, like, the second scene, and I sort of knew what I, I was a good shooter. I just didn't know how to shoot porn. I mean, I hadn't shot porn, yeah. so I just didn't know the etiquette of shooting porn. Or the angles. Uh, or the angles, and I learned them on that first scene. And, uh, and then by the end of the night, he's like, okay, well, you're a good shooter. I'm like, oh, thanks. <laughs> Vogel and I would become friends, but that first day I just thought he was a jerk. Yeah, how long did it take you to learn how to shoot? Well, to learn really, really well, uh, you know, probably a couple of months, but um, to learn the basics, you know. But there were things I would always learn. I was asked to come shoot a scene for, remember, uh, John T-Bone? I loved him, yeah. 
I was out, asked to come shoot outside somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And it was this British girl that squirted. That's all I can remember. Redhead? Yep. Sarah. Sarah. Sarah something. Sarah and Tommy Byron. Uh-huh. And I don't know, I'm just shooting. And she's laying on her back and Tommy's fucking her. And uh, John says, okay, pull back. She's got a squirt. And I, I, I went, what? And <laughs> I went, what? And Tommy pulled out and I had the camera and she was like, <clears throat> like a fire hose. And I'd never seen a girl squirt. On I didn't your face? Know. No, no, oh, it wasn't okay. that high, but I just, I was like, oh my God, we broke her somehow, you know, she's broken. <laughs> I just never seen, I, honestly, I didn't know there was such a thing as female orgasms. I'd never seen a woman squirt. Wow. And I was like, oh, 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 you know, but I held the shot. I held the shot. What? I shot in Cuba one time, and I shot a, I shot a Santera uh, ritual where the guy in the middle of no, out of nowhere, pick, and I didn't ask on the way out to the countryside why there was a chicken on board the bus. I didn't ask that question. And in the middle of it all, shooting an exorcism, he picks up this chicken and comes right up to my camera and he was missing his two front teeth, but he came right up to my camera and just pulled the chicken's head one way and the body the other one and bit its head off and poured the blood in its in his mouth and then poured some rum in his mouth and then psh, spit it everywhere. And I was just like, in my mind, I was just like, hold the shot, just hold the shot. Don't do anything, just hold the shot. Because this is what I used to do in, the war, in a war zone, you know, when they're shooting. It's just like, hold, just hold the fucking shot. Machine so, guns going off in those. And just hold the shot. Wow. So uh, when Sarah squirted, I was just like, hold the shot, just hold the shot. Don't ask a question, just hold the shot. <laughs> <laughs> to get uh-huh. the shot. If I had moved that camera, John would have killed me. So, yeah. How did you like John? Uh, I didn't work for him that much. He had a really bad reputation, but, you know, hey. like being an asshole, but uh, I didn't work for him enough. I liked him. I mean, I shot with him a couple times, and he was nice enough. I heard he passed away. Um, maybe passed away so. a year ago or something Oh, yeah. Like that. Maybe I heard that. Unfortunately. No, but- I just heard Dave Cummings passed away. All right. Mm-hmm. I like John T. Bone quite a bit. Mm-hmm. John T. Bone, they say had a bad reputation, but everybody that I saw work for him liked him, loved him, mm-hmm. and I loved him. He took me to Thailand for TT's Oriental Adventure mm-hmm. back in '91. Mm-hmm. He was he's wonderful, and I I wanted to see him before he died, but that's life. But he was um, it was cool. But uh, so, what was your perspective of sex? You know what I mean? What type of I mean? It seems to me like you're into journalism. So if you're so um, consumed with uh, subject, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. sex is secondary or third. So it, what was your perspective? It was for a long time, and I'll tell you my perspective, my, my priority, because I was also a mainstream actress. Whoa, really? And I directed theater. So for a long time, my priority was getting a good performance. And back then, back then in the 90s, Talent saw themselves more as as performers, as actors, you know? It was not... Uh, Hollywood. Yes, it was not uncommon to have 20-page scripts, and talent was used to that. They're not used to it now. I've had people on set lately who showed up and had a paragraph of dialogue and said, what? I can't do dialogue. I can't... Uh, Hollywood? No, no, no. Porn, porn. Porn, porn. But I like to direct the actors. Like, I, I like to direct performance so I liked directing Stephen St. Croix and I liked directing Randy Spears who could actually give you a really good performance um whoever it was Nina Hartley whoever the actress was so that in the beginning that was my that was a big motivator was I want to get good performances which frankly nobody really cares about and also I have a very aesthetic I'm just wired aesthetically I'm wired to 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 have nice visuals and have everything very symmetrical. I like things that are that are clean lines. And so my life was all about lighting, all about art direction, all about performance. If you talk to your cousin, Sean, he will tell you. <laughs> Blue edge, that was the thing. I wanted beautiful lighting with a nice edge on the girl's skin. And I would spend hours to get that. And then it's like, oh, sex? Okay, let's do it. The person that taught me 
the value of everything else does is is secondary sex is the thing was uh shishi larue because oh, yeah. she she oh. used to sit there just like oh, oh, yeah oh, spit on it oh, you know and i would watch him and i realized how enthralled and excited he got about the sex and i went oh yeah it took me a long time to get there too and i was like oh yeah that's what we're here for and then that became my main focus, is good sex. I still wanted it to look great, and I still wanted it to work in terms of being justified with a good performance, but then it was about good sex. Because when I came into that, I was all about giving good scenes, great sex. Mm -hmm. So, so, but my, my real, the question really was, what was your perspective? On like, sex? Of you, yourself. How did, what kind of person, because you're in a sex business now, you're in porn, you're in mainstream before. Right? So this is a different world. So yeah. what is like, what is your idea of sex? Were you a sexual person? Were you, um, well, look, one person, I was a hippie. Then I came through the disco era. Then I was a punk. So I had sex, particularly during the whole, you know, clubbing scene and the disco time of, of, of Hollywood. Yeah. I had sex with more people. I mean, I couldn't tell you their names, you know? You know, <laughs> yeah, you're having fun in a club one night. You're picking someone up. And it's like, I'm sorry. Was your name Tom or Tim? I, you know, who really? cares? Right. <laughs> I had a ton of sex, which is not to say that I was comfortable with sex. There's a difference. You can have a lot of sex. You can go through all the motions, but I think it was only when I had been on set for some period of time that, you know, we have a very interesting world here. Outside of our world, and it doesn't matter how many people you've had sex with, there's still, may not be that this way now, but back, let's say, 10 years ago, there's still, um, uh, there's still a taboo aspect to it. It doesn't matter whether you're, whether you're fucking someone different every night. There's still something that's just kind of naughty about it in a way. There's just like this edge to it. And when you get into the adult space you were applauded for the more sexually expressive you can be. You know, the more you can talk about it, the more you can express what you want, the more sp specific you can get about what you want, the more we applaud you for doing a great job. So I have to say I became more accepting about sex, about my own sexuality and my own kind of fantasies and my own fetishes. When I, I don't think I even knew I had fetishes particularly. I didn't think about it. But when you get into this business, you, you really begin to embrace it because it's, because you're, it, it's an approval when you're in this business to, to absolutely embrace it, right? So that's another thing that gave me a lot of insight into the women in this business because I did a show for many, many years called Adult Television Entertainment where I, it was like Entertainment Tonight, but it was on the adult business. It was like this, but it was on set. And I interviewed probably every actor and every actress over a three or four year period that came in and out of the business. I mean, I was on three or four sets a week interviewing everybody that was there. Directors, actors, everybody. I got them when they came in. I got them at the two or three year mark when they got burned out and they left. I got them at the four year mark when they came back in. Um... And in talking to them, they all would say the same thing back then in one way or another. They would ex somewhat express it with different words, but they would all essentially say, when I was a kid, I was highly sexualized. I thought I was weird. And then I got into the adult business and I finally feel like I, I'm at home. Like I found my, like I found my tribe or I found my family as dysfunctional as it is. I found where I belong. And I would say that that was not the same thing for me, but it was, you f just find an acceptance of whatever your sexuality is. It's okay. And we're going to, we're going to clap about it. And that's then it, that's a very freeing process. So, yeah. So I was, did I have a lot of sex coming in? Yes. Was I highly sexualized? Yeah. And that I had a lot of sex, but could I have been comfortable talking about it? Not at all. Did you ever get excited watching one of the scenes hmm. that you shot while you're shooting? While I'm shooting it? Yeah. Probably not. 
only because your agenda is very different at that point. Sometimes, yes, maybe. I mean, I would ask you this. It's very different for guys in the business. Obviously, you have to show up and you have to perform. If you talk to girls, how many times do you actually have an orgasm? You know, it's like one out of 10, one out of 20. Well, I was working with well, them. Well, okay, okay. Oh, well, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it in a different way. <laughs> in a different way. So we used to have people, it doesn't happen as much now because the crews are smaller and the environments are different. But back in the day when you had these big productions, there were always the civilians that would come on set, particularly when you were at Vivid, because they always had some, you know, insurance broker or some Hollywood guy that wanted to come to a porn set. Big brand, you know. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I once had the Milwaukee Bruins on set, the entire team on set. And it always goes the same way. People come on, they're very, very nervous, they don't know what to expect, they think it's going to be really sexy. They realize it's completely boring. And within five minutes, they're asking where the, you know, craft services are so they can get a Coke, right? They're just, and they, they wander off. It just gets to be, they realize it's like any movie, it gets to be boring. And I would always get one question from one guy, which is, are those girls really excited having an orgasm? And I would say, I don't know. Is your wife really having an orgasm? <laughs> really? Well, of course. And I'd be like, yeah, okay, you just keep believing that. What? I'm like, no, they're not really. I mean, you were different because you were gonzo and you were straight through. You'd start a scene, it would go straight through. You know, when we were shooting, it was stop, start, stop, start, close up. We got to shoot soft, turn over. We got to do this. Open your leg. We got to shoot hard. Get the mic in there. Get the sea light in there. It's a very artificial environment. But there I, were times when people would get it, would really, when the women would really have orgasms. But I focused yeah. very hard on trying to make the girls orgasm. Yeah. So that was one of my uh, ambitions, mm -hmm. to be, a, you know, make the girls happy, too. And that's probably why you were a great performer, because that was one of your big goals. Yeah. Right? Think, As opposed to just pump, 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 let's get out of here. Yeah, I want to do, I want to... Make it just beautiful. You know, everything I could do to um, make it good. Use all the energy I had. And I used to, um, I know the girl's body pretty well mm -hmm. after all the experience. But Sure. But yeah. You know, I'll tell you the hottest scenes. And I think the scene, there was a girl, it's weird. I saw her in my yoga class a couple of years ago. She's, she's a nurse now. Why is it that so many people leave this business and go into healthcare? It's really weird. A big majority of them, uh, maybe because they're just comfortable with bodies, I guess. But they anyway, want to help people. I don't know. Uh, maybe. Or they need help when they get into business, and now they want to help. They get maybe. cured. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, she was not the prettiest girl in the business. Um, I can't remember her name. I want to say it was something like Renee. Renee something. Not the prettiest girl in the business, didn't have the best body in the business, but every guy wanted to work with her. And that's because when the scene started, she never broke eye contact, ever. She was looking at you the whole time. She didn't do this. She, you know, she didn't do the European girl. She didn't do the European girl thing, which was like looking at the ceiling, thinking about the shoes she's going to buy, <laughs> looking off, closing her eyes, doing whatever. No, no, no. She never closed her eyes. She kept you. She was focused. And that forced the performer to be focused, the male performer to be for focused. And you could see it happen with them. Every single time she worked, everything around them would just fade away. There'd be no set, there'd be no nothing. I've seen male performers like that, where you have to say to them a few times, hi, I need you to do, hi, hey, hey. You know, there's a, some of those performers are out there where you have to talk to them a couple of times and then they go, what? You know, they were, she would force her, her partner to focus. And I always used to tell performers, particularly non-performer performers <laughs> and it's the hardest thing they could ever do this is very interesting the hardest thing they would ever do is i would say when you talk to when you're delivering this line just look at the person okay sure that's easy so honey i just got home no uh, no what did you do you just looked away look at the person i i was looking no you weren't you looked away just don't look oh, just look at the person okay okay yeah i got it i got it 
honey, I just got home. No, you just did it again. It was so hard. And then when you would say, okay, now go in to kiss her. I always did this. I always did it almost as a test. Let's say, okay, go in and kiss her. I want you to kiss her. And then I want you to pull back and look at her and then kiss her again. Sexy. They kiss her. And then they pull back and one of them would break eye contact because looking at each other is the only moment that's real. That's the only moment out there that's real. And that makes everybody nervous. So trying to really look at them, that's tough. And then you know who's real and who's not. Out, who's, who's actually having a real moment is if they can actually look at each other. This is the old thing about the one thing you never ask a prostitute to do is kiss you. That's too personal. Right. She'll blow you, you know. Weird, right? That's weird. Well, it's the same thing. It's, the, la it's the last... Um, gift they have to give and they don't want to give they it don't up. want to give it because it's so personal yeah. they can fuck you because they can just close their eyes and think about something else they can blow you because they can close their eyes and think about something else right but to kiss you <clears throat> and look at you they're not going to ever be that real with you unless they're going to be real with you one time not one time but when i used to look at the girls because <laughs> i was a eye contact type of person mm -hmm. i look at them <laughs> <laughs> Some of the girls got scared. <laughs> I'm not working with this lunatic. <laughs> I say, hey. Hi. <laughs> yeah, they think we're going to like. <laughs> they're like, I swear, what, one girl ran off the set. I didn't even do anything. She's, I'm not working with him. That's funny. So most guys weren't so intense as me, but yeah, yeah. yeah. that's just a funny story. Yeah. So um, what act, did you ever go out with anybody in the biz? Mm -mm. I never heard any stories. No. Never. Never. Or is it undercover? No, no, it's not even Never. undercover. Really? I just didn't. It was because it, I would have found it too weird then to be back on set with them. I didn't want anybody getting weird. I didn't want to put them in a weird situation. Um, no, no, I didn't. And it's funny because today when I was having lunch with Marcy and we were talking to this performer, Will Pounder, he said something about... Um, for this new business we're launching and he said um you know the the most valuable thing you can give to people that they really need is a safe space to shoot their content i said what he said oh yeah there's lots of studios out there they'll shoot content they'll help them shoot content they'll <clears throat> arrange content trades but then they're gonna want a blowjob at the end of the day and i'm like well I think my reputation would be that that ain't an issue, right? So yeah, yeah. So and I and I do think that for both Marcy and I, that probably is one of the things that recommends us the most is that we've both been in the business over twenty years, and we've never, you know, intentionally screwed someone over, and we're not out to somehow take advantage of anybody, a, a man or a woman for that matter. So. Uh, it was interesting because I was thinking about that earlier at lunch today that I've never, yeah. never had a relationship with anybody in the business. No. Not talent. Not cameraman, yes. But oh, so you went out with the cameraman. Well, I lived with one for oh. eight years. Uh, a guy named Ivan Treadway. You wouldn't know him. I don't oh. think he just shot for us. And then also Greg, a guy named Greg Stark, otherwise Greg Steele, who directed for directed with Brad Armstrong in the early days. Oh, yeah, I know those guys. So crew, because you end up meeting, that's who you meet and that's who you hang out with, but never talent. That would just feel weird. Yeah. And then what if they call me and they want me to hire them and uh -huh. I can't and I well, feel bad and it was just too too much conflict. Too much Harvey Weinstein shit with that. Yeah, I, mean, I guess your <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess your mind is out there looking ahead. That's, you know, more than most people you know especially camera people yeah. but you're a director and a camera of course you're a lot different after doing all that yeah. work in central america yeah. and having you know the drive to do all that um flying into dangerous territories yeah. you know so you're a totally different animal out there but um <clears throat> was there any actors that you looked upon while you're watching them work and say that guy looks like he's pretty good like he's a good fuck he's I mean, did any actor, you know, you say Yeah, well? I mean, I always thought, I always thought um, Randy Spears was great. Because um, he was another one that always had a lot of eye contact. Like, it was just him and the girl in that moment. So I thought Spears was great. I thought, um, I always thought Steve Hatcher was really sexy. 
Steve Hatcher was a little really well, down in the down, you know, yeah. a little this and that. But I thought I thought he was a really sexy, smart performer. Um, I didn't think the obvious guys like Jean Valjean, you know, I even know who that was. You don't know who Jean Valjean was? Uh. Oh my god! So at one point, I was working with Playgirl. I was basically creating their broadcast operations and shooting all the content for for launching a broadcast operation. And I was looking for new talent, beautiful guys, because that was the whole thing for Playgirl, was that all the guys be really beautiful. And uh, I was at some... What year was this? 2005, I think, because I started with Penthouse in 2006. Okay. And uh, it was right before Penthouse. And... um, I were at some studio, God, it was a horrible little thing in a little mini mall off of like Satikoy or something. It was two studios. You had to go into two different doors. Anyway, I'm in the studio. It's got all these hallways and I'm standing there and I'm thinking, God, I just need one just killer guy. And I, <laughs> I look and this French guy steps out into the hallway, tall, long blonde hair, beautiful face, amazing body and I looked at him and for a minute I just went god did I just imagine that because I was just saying I need one beautiful guy and I turn and he steps there and I said what's your name and he said my name is Jean Valjean <laughs> and that's I a went, good name are you a performer and he said oui and I said come here I got a job for you uh he was like he was interesting he's still around he, he surfaces back into the business every once in a while he he took everything I just talked about in terms of eye contact and he exploited it to the point that that's why as much as I loved him because he was just like the sweet puppy, I never bought him because he was too manipulative. So he would, when he was talking to you, he was just like this. He would never break eye contact in, in a conversation. He was, I was just like, stop, st- why are you staring at me like that? But, but you and, thought he was sexy, so kind of... Yeah, he really played it. You know, he knew. <clears throat> like, he knew what I was just telling you about eye contact. Uh-huh. He learned that when he was 14 somewhere. Somebody told him, don't ever break eye contact with the girl. And he just kept doing it. And also, he would always step just right into your space. Like, I can't do it because you're over there at a microphone. But if this is where the normal person would stand, he'd always stand like that. And it would be like, I, I, first time I ever met him in that studio... He, he kind of made me nervous because he was in my space and he wouldn't, he was just like this on his eyes. The next time he did it again and I just said, would you back up, please? <laughs> really? He goes, what? I said, you don't need to be like up on, I, I don't need to be feeling your breath, okay? And don't like stare at me like that because it doesn't work. You said me. that to him? Yeah, I said, don't stare at me because <laughs> it's work. not working. And he goes, and then he kind of laughed, but so I knew he, he knew what he was doing, but yeah, so... Uh, Oh, wow. That's a, he was a nice-looking guy, huh? He was a good-looking guy. And uh, he was back in the era of... There were a few of them back then. There was Reno. Remember Reno? He was a big, buff, long-haired, Fabia-looking guy. And there was another one, Lee Stone. Remember Lee Stone? Yeah, I remember Lee Stone. Yeah, He's a nice Lee, guy. nice, really nice guy. Uh, Reno, I saw him about a year ago. He's doing, like, dog training and dog rescue, and I have a rescue. So he, oh. he ended up coming to my ranch to do a calendar called biceps and bullies it was big beefy guys with like uh bully breed dogs like pit bulls and bulldogs and stuff it's pretty funny they did a really good job of it but so there was a whole bunch of those really kind of buffy actors back then oh when the viagra came yeah true when the viagra came in yeah absolutely Absolutely. before that yeah well spears was around before that spears was around he was but there's no way in hell he could have performed next to me yeah. comfortably. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? And actually, by the time I started working with Randy, you know, he would he would struggle. Yeah. He would have to step off and and yeah. get an edge and step back in and step off and get an edge and right. step back in. So, What about working with Mark Davis? The girls loved him. Oh, Mark Davis, yeah. I, I, you know, when you're... When you've been in the business for long enough, you can almost say you almost did everybody's first scene, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Mark Davis. And when Mark Davis was with Kobe Ty, because Kobe Ty was a vivid girl, uh-huh. <clears throat> Mark was great. Um, who else was Peter around? North? I never worked with Peter. I think I worked with Peter once. I worked with Rocco a couple of times. He's good. He's great. Yeah. Um, 
first time I walk, worked with Rocco, we were shot at this place out in Moore Park called the Avocado Ranch. Yeah, we used to shoot at the Avocado Ranch all the time in the 90s. You know how weird it was to drive out there. It was like way out Those there. Those trees nowhere. going through that. One street with all the trees. So it was the first Call time trees. I was going out there, and I didn't know my way, and it was a Stuart Canterbury shoot, and I was just a camera person, and I didn't know anybody. I mean, I was very early in the business. So, but this is not with Vivid. <laughs> not with Vivid. So this is before Vivid? Uh, no, this was, I, I don't, maybe I didn't go under contract with Vivid right away, because okay. there were a few people I shot with in the very beginning, Gabor being one of them. Who was a very nice guy. So, yeah, sweetheart. And uh, it was Gabor's first big film. It was like 101 Arabian Nights. I actually had a camel on set. Wow, and money, huh? Uh, yeah. What was the budget? It was, oh, I don't know. It was probably 40000 was when Gabor was, you know, yeah. So, um, driving out there. And all of a sudden, this little car is behind me, like a little convertible with this guy in it. And we, I pull up to a stop sign, and the guy kind of comes around and pulls next to me. And I look at him, and he says, uh, I, I, I am lost. And I said, are you going to a set? And Because he, he looked like an actor. And he goes, yes. And I said, well, I think I know the way. Just follow me. So he follows me. We pull up. Stuart comes rushing out to go talk to him. And I'm getting my stuff together in my car, and I see they keep looking over, and he keeps looking over, and Stuart's saying something, and they look over again. And Stuart came up to me and said, uh, he th I told him you're the cameraman. He thought you were the talent. And I said, did that, like, scare him? He goes, no, no, no. He, he said he thought it would be good if you were talent. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Uh, but Rocco was great and sexy, amazingly sexy. Um... I don't know who else was, like, always on game. Like, who was on game all the time and never struggled? I mean, in the early days, um, Evan was great. Didn't last forever. Oh, come on. That... No, in the very first days when he first came in. Look, here's the ones that first came in that were good. No, with... Hang on. Viagra. Pre-Viagra. Pre-Viagra. You know? Okay. Well, there was Evan. There was Dale. DeBone. There was Joey, Joey Ray. All those guys were around. Well, maybe they were on Viagra. I just know I didn't have problems with them until a certain point, and then I always had problems with them. <laughs> right, when the Viagra wore out. I guess, when it just didn't take an effect in, anymore. So, because yeah. especially the first one you named, who is a nice person, and who I don't want to disrespect because he's nice, but I was on plenty of sets watching the struggle. So how did you not struggle? What do you think was special about you that made, that made it, you were able to perform different girls, different scenarios, different places? Why do you think you were always able to perform? Well, there's a lot of factors. I come from a really gnarly place. I grew up working in Death Valley in a mining camp at six years old, in an open pit, 120 degrees. My mom died when I'm four. You know, my father's rough gangster. You know, so you don't get, you know, any um, TLC, mm -hmm. you know, it's a uh, tough love, New York mm -hmm. roughness, you know, and um, second, my mind, you know, I have a focus, a very strong focus, and I've always been able to picture things and focus very hard, and I didn't want to go back to hell, mm -hmm. back to working on trucks or back mm -hmm. to working in a mine. And I loved girls, the last part, more than probably 99% of anybody in this business. Mm -hmm. You know, I loved them. So all those factors together, and I don't like to lose. I don't want to be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. So all those factors. But you had to work with girls you didn't like, right? Yeah. Girls that didn't turn you on, that didn't excite you. So did you just have a place in your mind that you could go to when you had to be with a girl that didn't turn you on at all? Yeah, the truth is that. Many of the girls were not my type, mm -hmm. you know? I liked a certain type. I liked blondes if they're just the way I like them. Mm -hmm. I like dark hair girls, mm -hmm. but I also like dark skin, mm -hmm. you know? Brown skin, blacks. <coughs> right. So that got me more excited. So what did I have to do? I um, would definitely focus to another mm -hmm. situation. Or I would find something on the girl, you know? One or the other. <clears throat> but I never, ever failed 
from 3,000 scenes or more. Wow. Never, ever had a problem. Wow. That's and amazing. I used to do two to four scenes all the time, you know, in all the horror conditions. And none of the actors really wanted to work next to me. Mm -hmm. That's what I noticed a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Only a few people would work next to me. Mm -hmm. But when the other actors did work next, they didn't like it because I was smashing. Did you do multiple scenes? Like, I mean, did you do scenes where there were multiple guys? Yeah, yeah. Like DPs and all that stuff? I was, I'm so strong, you know, I just play the bottom for DP or the top, whatever. Mm -hmm. Any, any way, any place, I did tons of gang bangs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes I'd do the gang bangs and I'd have to do all the work. Mm -hmm. Because these other guys either would intimidate them mm -hmm. or they were just too lame. And mm -hmm. if I liked a girl, then I'll do all the work. So, so a lot of people didn't like that. You know, the other actors, they used to talk shit. Mm -hmm. So I used to go knock them out. Well, <laughs> but, um, Did you really slap Derek, uh, what's his face? Yeah, I smacked that him. Stupid, that stupid agent. He went flying th through the air, landed, and was screaming on the ground like a little girl. There's something that I enjoy so much when I hear that story. Oh, he had um, said something about my cousin, who was probably was true, so I was probably wrong. But of course, you know, I back up my family. And of course, he didn't back me up, you know what I mean? But I backed him up and I said, hey, don't talk to me on the phone that way. Don't get ever get smart with me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't get smart with me. I had a lot of street fighting, you know, mm -hmm. all those crazy stories, 10, 20 people and me only, mm -hmm. you know, in all the nasty hoods mm -hmm. and all the crazy situations. But <clears throat> I said, and he goes, are you threatening me? I go, yeah, where are you? Right? Where the fuck are you? Because I'm, you know, I'm very nice. And you get smart with me? And I'm always so nice? No. You got the wrong guy. Right? <laughs> so he hung up the phone on me. And so I was thinking about how do I get him to a, a spot where I could beat him up? <laughs> right? <laughs> You know, and plus he was racist, and I don't like racist people. I have a pro-black company, you know what I mean? And, you know, all my black actors want my, the girls work, my black actors working with his girls. And I take offense. He didn't like my uncle. I took offense to that. A lot of things. But I liked him still before because he was mm -hmm. a, a guy that had a shit get together. And I mm -hmm. appreciate, you know, a smart, slick person. Mm -hmm. So I had, you know, some type of parallel relationship or a common bond with him. Mm -hmm. But... Don't get smart with me and take me as one of your hookers. Mm -hmm. And so then me and my boy Dion were at the UFC fight, you know, because Kevin Beach had bought 20 tickets. Yeah. He said, you want a couple? I said, yeah. So me and Dion went. And I could have said, Dion, I guess where I saw it there because this is like five months later. I'm still hungry to get him. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm still thirsty. <sighs> right? And um, ironically... We walk into the arena, to our seat, two seats to the left, the next row down, there he is. I just looked and I said, Oh God. Wow, God just gave me a gift. <laughs> <laughs> right? I said, Wow. I go, Hey. Hey, you know. And he goes, Oh, what? I said, We got a problem. I thought we were done. I said, No, it's not done. You know? And so I didn't know what to do then because, you know, it's, I can't, you know, I'm smart with how, where I do things. Mm -hmm. You know, and so then I was like, what am I going to do? If I punch him, maybe I kill him. <laughs> if I, if I slap him, you know, I have really hard punches, you know, mm -hmm. that's what saved me in all my street fights, mm -hmm. fast, hard punches. And maybe not the most technical boxer, but I have really nice, hard punches mm -hmm. and hard, heavy hands. So they worked, you know, for me. So it made me survive through a lot of crazy yeah, yeah, situations. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? And so then I just went to the bathroom. It was the weirdest thing. I go to the bathroom. He looks at me right when I'm walking by him so I don't smack him or whatever, I guess. I go to the bathroom and I come out. There's a wait in a line to the bathroom. You know, this is a big fight. I think uh, Chuck and... Um, Rashad Evans, mm -hmm. I think. Anyways, I come out. There he is. Right in my sight. <laughs> like, looking right at me. 
like across the aisle way into the cut before you go downstairs. Yeah. And I'm like, that guy crazy? Right? <laughs> you know, is he totally crazy to, to be there? Whoa, all right. You know what I mean? So I walk up to him. I said, hey. I said, you know, very quiet, right? I said, hey. I can't really say the motherfucker. I said, listen. He's like, huh? So what, he really wasn't there for me, but that I, I understand later. So I said, I'm going to give you a chance to apologize, you know? He did, you know what I mean? He said, huh? Like he's, you know, pompous, right? And he wouldn't apologize, so I said, all right, boom! I smacked him. <laughs> <laughs> but I think he pushed me, and then I just bitch slapped him. But you don't want to be bitch slapped. I mean, I got really heavy hands, and I studied, you know, for a lot of years, a lot of arts. Mm -hmm. And so I love, one of my turn-ons is to leverize my punch. Mm -hmm as the maximum I can, or the slap. Mm -hmm. So I'm just programmed to leverize as much as I can, which means get all your body weight through something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? So I smacked him, and he went flying through the air. We just have a little slap, and he was crying on the ground, <laughs> screaming. Yeah. Screaming. I, I must have hit him in the jaw and the ear because that's my target. And I said, oh, shit. You know, I was ready for a right hand to come back because I thought, you know, he's going to, he, he was bigger than me. He was heavier. He's like a London street fighter dude, I thought. Yeah, like well. Like a Lon London mobster type. One slap. But, you know, people are very, people always underestimated me in the streets. And that's a great advantage, right? Because pretty soon you're just unconscious. And oh. so. <laughs> and it came out of nowhere. Yeah, just a bit. You know I mean? <laughs> very, very, very smooth, very quiet. And then a girl came up. Ah, ah. And I was like. Well, he's not getting up. I'm not going to hit him when he's down, you know, because I don't hate him that bad. He's already done, you know, and I don't like getting in trouble. So I phew, ran to my seat, right? <laughs> so I guess the thing was that he took the girl to the bathroom at the wrong time, you know, but it was Sad. lucky for me, you know, and he didn't complete, took it like a man. You know, I didn't destroy him. I just slapped him hard and one slap and that was it. But, you know, I have hard slaps. I wouldn't want to slap myself. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't <laughs> Anyways. But yeah, so. Good story. Thanks. Good story. You like it? Yeah. yeah I got all kinds story. of crazy stories about, you know, the streets. The people went, oh, yeah, TT. Oh, yeah. Because I'm sure you're, oh, yeah, you're a tough guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, it don't all happened. Don't slap you. <laughs> it all happened. So, you know, I mean, I had 20 guys on me three or four different times. You know, big guys too. <clears throat> you know, ten guys, but me and three or four guys, tons of guys, tons mm -hmm. of times. That's mm -hmm. not even you know, that's just normal. Anyways, so Jesus. back to you. If huh? I have to go to a street, if I have to go to a bar in a bad neighborhood, I know who I'm taking. Well, I mean, I'm getting older now. You know, <laughs> uh, a lot of you look like you could still deliver a good slap. Yeah, that yeah, fall back into that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so those actors, I don't think they were real. Actors, but the actors, you know, Rocco is a great actor, a real performer. Mm -hmm. You know, Mark Davis is a real performer, mm -hmm. and um, Steve was a real performer too. He mm -hmm. didn't do much work, but he was, you know, he was a nice guy. I liked mm -hmm. him. But yeah, Randy Spears is real. All those guys, but yeah. So, what about the girls? Which girls did you ever say these girls are beautiful? This girl is unbelievable. She's pretty. She's beautiful, and she's a very good performer. Did you ever look at any of those girls and say, "Wow"? Yeah, a, a lot, a lot. I mean, um, I, you know, <clears throat> sometimes they would spin out later and I would, you know, lose them to some extent. But, um, I mean, I loved Janine. I loved Janine. She had the best boobs ever. Really? Uh, yeah. Did you ever work with Janine? No. Oh, no, she was a girl girl all no, the time. They wanted me to work with her and something happened. It, just at the end of my retirement, because I, you know, I pretty much mm -hmm. quit at 2005, mm -hmm. Four, no, six, but I wasn't working. You know what I mean? I just was not working after 2002 for anyone. Mm -hmm. But they called me special. Marcy called me. I was going to do it for her. Mm -hmm. But I really wasn't working. But So I didn't, I worked with her in a masturbation scene, kind of, where she was a tease mm -hmm. for me back in 99. or Not for me, but for Vivid mm -hmm. in 99. Mm -hmm. But that's, mm -hmm. I can't even remember seeing her breasts, but they were that great. God, they were beautiful. She had, she had 
a, a boob job, but you couldn't tell it. She just had amazing, just amazing body, and <clears throat> I thought she was beautiful, and just, you know, all those girls. Crazy girl, D Debbie Diamond. I love Debbie Diamond. I love Debbie Diamond. She's, She's a beast. Yep, she is a beast. She but is a beast. Nice. But just wonderful. Nice. Um, but I wouldn't say she's beautiful. No, she wasn't beautiful. No. She was, but she was a, an amazing performer. Amazing. Like I always wanted to hire her. You know, she's she. In my opinion, I don't know what guys could you know keep up with keep her. up with her. I could, but you know, you really have to be a strong person. Yeah, she was really overwhelming. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I loved her, and I thought her performances were always like really top notch. Uh, Bella Donna, before she actually went and started doing her own stuff. I mean, I directed her when she was really young and something, and she was great. When she was with Nacho still yeah. then? Yeah, uh, yeah, but, but even early on into that, you know, she was not long in the business. Um, she loves sex, right? Yeah, she does, and you can tell that. I mean, that's that She's really... A real... Janine was very sweet, a hell of a personality. Yeah, absolutely. Um, who else? Savannah. Who what do you think of Savannah? I only worked with Savannah that one time, and it was not too very, very long. Oh, Savannah. Which Savannah are we talking about? The dead about? one. The, de the dead one. No, I mean, she was, I, I liked the her. dead one. <laughs> uh, yeah, I only worked with her one time. She was pretty, though. Yeah, she was really pretty. Because yeah. um, there was another Savannah that yeah. was the vivid girl Savannah. Right. They are both um, vivid. Yeah, that's right. That's actually, that's actually right. Um, I worked with Jenna when she was really young, before she had, you know, plastic surgery. And when she, I did Jenna and Rocco together. I directed a movie called Jenna Loves Rocco. Oh, yeah. um, she's really sweet. And I don't know if she'd really come into her own at that point. So I'm not so sure that she, that I would say she loved sex. Um, she was smart. She was cool. She's very smart. Personality. Great. Very good. Very good at the time. Um, now, today, who do I love? Uh, you know, I love, she only does girls, but I, I just really like her because she's very smart and she's very professional as, uh, Charlotte Stokely. I worked with her about a month ago. She's really good. Wow, she's still around. And looks amazing. She was cool. She worked for looks my company a lot. amazing. Uh, I think, she, as I said, I think she only does girls, but she just always rips it up and she's really good and she's just really twisted and I like that professional by now yeah. for sure yeah that's yeah, a trip. Yeah. yeah absolutely so um I don't know I'm trying to think of who else really stands out for me Jan um, yeah you did a lot of vivid movies? I did tons of vivid so uh Gentile Kobe Tai oh let's talk about Kobe Tai oh and Asia Carrera Asia Carrera was great in her time. She was very sexy, uh, yeah. Kobe Tai was brilliant. when That was back before she was married to Mark Davis, and she, she was great. great. I love Kobe Tai would show up. She's, you know, she weighed like 80 pounds, and she was tiny. And she would show up on set, and that's when we had big catering. And she would always ask catering to make her a whole package of bacon. I'm like, what? Like where and she would eat an entire box of bacon for breakfast. I'm like, where are you putting all of that? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, she was really small. Really tiny. And she's a spinner, right? She, she was, was really a spinner, tiny. but she was great. I yeah. have you know, she I always judge a lot of the girls by the goods. Mm -hmm. I was a goods type of person. Mm -hmm. I can really could have been a doctor, you mm -hmm. know, because I'm very perceptive. And she had great goods. How about D? Do you love D? She was real sweet. You didn't like her as a performer? No, she was great. She worked for me. She was nice, you know, for my movies. And, mm -hmm. you know, I might even did a scene with her. And she was cool. But I guess the goods were good, but they weren't, they didn't blow me away. You know, mm -hmm. certain goods mm -hmm. blew me away. But she was sexy, cute, great body, great breast. Mm -hmm. And she was a cool, very nice person. I would never say anything bad about mm -hmm. her. But the goods were good, but not on the wild high level that mm -hmm. I... Mm -hmm. Appreciate it so much. So what makes for good goods? Genetics. This is a genetical thing. Mm -hmm. You know, just like a guy's got a big one, mm -hmm. a girl's got a different one. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's very strange. Mm -hmm. So you never know what you're getting. You never know until you're in it. But I like them fat. The look of them mm -hmm. fat. Mm -hmm. That doesn't always mean they're good, but generally it means they're a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Generally, but, you know, there's exceptions. So who were your favorite three performers? Well, I, you know, 
it's hard to say. So, there's so there's many, you know, yeah. and I have a very good memory of the girls, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and I liked so many close to that. And I liked my girls brown, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? But, you know, I liked them, yeah, yeah you know, um, I liked, I, I liked the black girls the most, you know? Who who did you work with when when you worked when I directed you? Who was in that bathroom? I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> I definitely can't remember that one. But I say that um, Jana Jackme was great to work with. Mm -hmm. But I did have really have a connection with Jenna in the scenes. Mm -hmm. So was, I had a good connection with Jenna, and she had some great stuff. Good, the goods were you know high mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you know, I used to sometimes I'd grade a girl by I'd stick it in there, right? And uh, if I pulled it out and it was pounding and bigger, I say the girl's got good, good stuff. Good. But if she gave it to me kind of wobbly, I would be like, "Which rare?" You know what I mean? Because I'm strong. I'd be like, "Well, there's a problem there, right?" But uh, Janet Jack, me Midori, mm -hmm. you know, I liked a lot. There was a girl way back named Shawnee Cates. Mm -hmm. She was great. And there's so many great girls. But those are some that really blew me away. But there was, uh, even Annie Cruz was here. She had some really good stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I mean, just, I liked Rebecca Bardot had good stuff. Rebecca Bardot, yeah, absolutely. Brittany Morgan had some good stuff. Uh, I was just going to say, Brit um, did you ever work with Brittany Andrews? Yeah. She still looks great. I just, she was on set. I'm like... Yeah, she Brit yeah. blonde. Yeah, so I voice, think, high squeaky little voice. Yeah, with the pointy nose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's, she's a nice she, person. Uh, yeah, I just saw her. I couldn't believe she was still working. She lives in Vegas, and um, she came in did a milf scene, and she was, you know, she looked great. Uh, I was like, wow, really? wow. Give me, give me the card of your surgeon because you look amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, how about Brianna? Did you ever work with Brianna I worked with Brianna's, one of her first scenes. Mm -hmm. And Brianna was so good for me because mm -hmm. her goods are way, way, way up mm -hmm. there, right? And actually, I watched our scene, which I never really did. Oh, there was another girl named Little, you didn't know her, Little Baby. Mm -hmm. She was, you know, great. But, um, Brianna has some goods that were way crazy. The movie, the scene we w did together for my movie, I watched numerous times. Mm -hmm. And she's great. Yeah. She was wonderful. I did it, yeah. She, when she was Mirage, mm -hmm. she was amazing. So this was a long time ago when you worked with Brianna? 99. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, she was just a little youngster. Mm -hmm. I was young, too. Yeah. But there's a lot of girls. But do, were you ever attracted to girls? I can't think of girl. I, yes, I've been attracted to girls, but I can't think of any that I was working with that I was. It's just when you when I work with them, it's just a different vibe, you know. It's you a, just a different relationship. Yeah. Now, sometimes yeah. you got to focus, but I shot a lot of scenes. I shot uh, hundreds of my own movies. Mm -hmm. You know, so I used to put five to seven scenes in a movie, and I shot so. Hundred, hundreds of my movies, so I could have, I could have shot over a thousand scenes myself. Yeah, probably easily. Yeah, you know what I mean. So me too, probably. I mean, I can't. It's weird that I can't remember most of them. This girl, the one that had the great eye contact, I want to say, what's her name? Ashley Renee, maybe. I don't remember. Not she, Ashlyn Gear, of course. No. Not Ashlyn Gear. She's a. She was. She was kind of going right as I was coming into the business. Ashlyn, Christy, Britt. You know, Tori Wells. They were all going out right as I was coming into the business. I think Tori Wells was already gone because I never saw her around. Yeah. But yeah. There was another redhead named Brittany. Oh, there was another redhead named Tiana Taylor. Mm, Tiana Taylor has yeah, some yeah, yeah. stuff <clears throat> on the same level as Brianna. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. You know, fat, puffy, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she yeah, was yeah. great. Yeah. So um, how many movies have you directed? Well, let's see. I was doing, uh, I don't know, well over a thousand. That's all I know. Really? That's all I know. Yeah. Some is Tony English, which was, so when I first started, I was told I had to have like a name, right? Like my nom de guerre. And uh, 
Marcy was a PM and she was working under the name Tony Brooks. And I was Irish English, so I just said, oh, okay, I'll be Tony uh, in English. And I directed under that name until 2005, I think. And then I started working for Playgirl. And then they asked me to be the national spokesperson. So I was going on Dateline and Morning, Good Morning LA and all these shows. Really? Wow. Yeah, and I couldn't, you know, how ca I couldn't talk about women, you know, not apologizing for their sexuality. And then I got a fake name. So I just dropped it and started using my real name. And so now, even today, even to this day, people will meet me and then I guess they'll go Google me and then they'll come back and go, oh, I didn't know you were Tony English. I was like, yeah, uh, yeah, okay, and? But yeah, so I think under both my names, probably well over a thousand. Because then I directed for um, Penthouse for years, five movies a month as well. And I was directing almost all my content. So until I got exhausted with that. How come we didn't, how come I didn't I work know. for you your movies out, that much? Well, you were, first of all, you were out of the business by 2000, when did you leave the business and start just doing your own stuff? Well, I mean, I started producing in 96, so by 2000, I was pretty much focused on my own stuff. On your own stuff. And I came into the business in about, I don't know, 96, 95, 96. 92, or, or 92 I thought. 92, but... 92. I was with Vivid. Uh, at that time, Vivid wouldn't almost dictate my cast, so mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe the Vivid girls were all scared of you. <laughs> uh, maybe. I was there for seven years, so I was there till 99. Yeah. So, but, but I think I worked for you two or three times. I think, I think. you did too. I think so. I think you did too. I just remember that one scene you're right up close. In the close. bathroom. Yeah, I remember that. I was like, yeah. <laughs> so you better be careful. <laughs> I don't know who she's next to. That's funny. That's did you funny. think I did good work? Can you remember? I'm sure. I, look, can't I'm remember. Sure. You were famous. I mean, you, you still are. You were famous for just being like the guy. The guy who could, oh, he did two scenes earlier today? No problem. T.T. Boyd is not going to have a problem with that. Yeah, yeah. I was strong, right? Yeah, totally strong. I told you the issue, if I said anything to you, it was don't pound her. <laughs> yeah. Like just, shh, shh, just take a moment, take a moment. I think I probably, I think I remember saying that to you. It's just take a moment, breathe. You mm -hmm. don't have to pound, pound her all the way through this. Just. You know, I used to um, do sprints, mm -hmm. you know, like five nights a week usually. I. About 12 o'clock at night, I go out in the streets and do 30, 50 yard sprints. Mm -hmm. That's like animal kind of workout, right? Mm -hmm. And so that really prepared, it was good for street fighting yeah, and it's great for sex. Yeah. So nothing, you know, sometimes we run five or six miles, that would be good, but it doesn't give you that, ah, the pure strength. So I don't think any of the other actors were doing what I was no. doing. No. You know? No, but remember when we were shooting, we were also shooting softcore, and we had to always, you know, there was, there was that moment where we had to get pull out, do the insert, hold. Duh. I think I remember being that was difficult to get from you because you were in it. I think I, uh, I think really? I think me, I think you were so in your scene that you were just go 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 go. And I have to say, hold on, slow down. Huh? Now huh? Act, pull out. It's possible. Let me get it. Let me but, get the insert. You know. But I'm a person who grew up taking orders. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I definitely would listen to what somebody mm -hmm. wanted. Mm -hmm. If, you know, nine nine times out of ten. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I would listen to you because I was... But I think you were just really, also, if I remember your performance, you were totally focused on the girl. Yeah. I, mean, I, try, I always try to do a good job, you know? I never was taking the job for granted because I don't want to go back to hell. To the mines. <laughs> I don't want to go back to... The pits. Garbage, you know, to hell. The yeah. No respect, no love, all that, you know? So... Did you, um, I mean, it seems to me like you got a little bit of, a little bit of luck on your side when you started, you know what I mean? Just to get into working with one of the best companies around and Tons nicest guys around. Tons of luck. Right? Tons of luck. And I don't ever forget that. Cause Steve is a nice, really nice guy. And he taught me a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And so a lot of luck and, and, um, you know, he was also, he was very different than I was. He was very different than Russ Hampshire. Hampshire was really emotional. I was more creative, kind of emotional. Steve's just like, click, 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 you know. I remember the first couple of movies I did. I did a movie with Diana Loren. And nice. Colt, nice Colt Steel oh, yeah. uh, called Boiling Point. And I was so proud of this movie. I worked so hard on it. I edited it. I turned it in. 
I waited. It was shot on film, and then I, and then I went in, and it was doing really well in sales. And I went, so did you see the movie? He goes, no, I didn't watch it. I said, oh, but it's a great movie. Would you watch it? I mean, I think it's better than what PT does. He <laughs> goes, I don't watch any movies. I said, come on. He goes, I don't watch any movies. I've never watched one of my movies. I said, come on, I'm begging you. He would not watch the movie. Wow, really? Yeah. So you were competitive with PT. Yeah, I was. I mean, PT had half my budget, and or double my budget. I had half of his, and and yeah, it was. I really wanted to uh, to do better movies than he than he did. Yeah, uh, on half the budget. That was a big thing. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. He kept. He won a lot of awards. Did you win a lot of? No, I didn't win any awards. What? No, I was with Vivid the whole time, and I had a small budget. He would do those every once in a while. Twice a year, he'd get these huge, humongous budgets that were just over the top. Like 100 some thousand? Yeah. yeah. 50 or 100? Or? Not 100, probably. 100. And uh, I never won anything. Really? Anything. Nothing? I was always the one doing the incredible work at half the cost. Oh, so you're the worker. That was okay. And that was okay. I liked what I did. I liked what I did. Well, it, was, it was like... It, it, from my point of view, you know, it looked to me like you were lucky, like the gods were like, you know, this this lady is out here in these dangerous neighborhoods, right? You get almost getting killed or possibly could have got killed any second with a stray bullet, right? Yeah. And these wild maniacs that are nice, but they're still maniacs. And why don't we help her a little bit, <laughs> you know? Pull, because there's nothing wrong with porn. Let's give her something a little bit easier, a little bit you know, uh, more fulfilling, uh, maybe not fulfilling, but maybe, I don't know, you know, or, so, but definitely more money, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you make your life easier. Did it? it the, oh, infinitely. It turned my life around. And I mean, in that, so Penthouse, I mean, uh, uh, Vivid led to Adam and Eve, which led to Wicked, which led to Playgirl, which then within a year, I literally, I left Playgirl, I was going to go start another business. I was in New York. Uh, talking to some some investors and uh, it was a Thursday and I got this call um, saying can you come to LA we want to talk to you about you know basically running production and the broadcast division for penthouse I'm like what actually I had met with them I'd done a couple little things and then they brought in the whole team from Playboy Jim English and all those all the whole team the whole sea level team the head of licensing the head of the magazine the head of the head of from penthouse or playboy from playboy, playboy. so oh. penthouse decided that the key to success if you wanted to compete with playboy is just hire all the executives from playboy which frankly is a harebrained thought but but they did it and i had been directing i directed just a few little solo things solo really pretty girl high end pretty girl penthouse pet stuff and then Jim English came in he was the head of entertainment he came to me one day at the ranch in Chatsworth and he said Kelly the ranch? oh your ranch okay yeah. he goes Kelly you know we're just not going to do pornography anymore we're going to do R-rated movies I said really you did that at Playboy and you guys went bankrupt with it but that's well I said great you know he didn't know anything about production well how do I do this how do I do that and I was very helpful to him and uh and they went on, and I went back to raising money for this company called Chick Media. And, um, and then six weeks later, I got this phone call when I was in New York. And they said, can you come back? And I said, and do what? And they said, can you come back and fire everybody? I said, what? What? Can you come back and fire the whole Playboy crew? It's not working out. And I'm like, well, I don't, it's not really what I do. I yeah, well, that sounds people. strange. And You're a hitman. Said, yeah, I'm like, whoa. Uh, and I said, it was Thursday afternoon, New York time. It was like about noon. And I said, you know, I can talk to you about it. I'll be back on Monday. And the guy who had become my CEO, who was also an amazing mentor to me, said, uh, no, I need you back tomorrow morning. I said, Tony, it's like noon on Thursday. He goes, well, this is what we're willing to pay you. And I went, okay, I'm heading to JFK right now. Just leave my bag at the hotel. I don't care. Got on a plane, came back Friday morning, walked into the conference room, and fired everybody. And I, I don't like firing people at all. It's a very painful situation, but brought them all in one by one. I remember Gary uh, Gary Gray, who was Jim English's assistant, walked in. He was the first one to go, and he walked in and sat down. He said, you're going to fire me, aren't you? And I said, yes, sadly, yes, I am. And that was it. Every one of them. So, and then I started doing production for 
penthouse and then I became the president of production and then I was very fortunate in launching all their broadcast operations. Penthouse became the largest adult broadcaster in the world despite what Hustler and Tony Kochi would like to say and um, it was the most successful division. It was making 70% uh, uh, of the revenue at that time. What kind of money is that? Uh, at that time it was about seven million and um, a year. Yeah, in broadcast. That's a gross. That was the gross. And, um, and uh, but I knew I had to, the company was a little hamstrung because it's, its parent corp was Friend Finder Networks and they had a very specific vision about the company or they had no vision about, about the company. And um, yeah, so I knew I had to buy the company to, to take it down the road I wanted to take it because it wasn't going to happen with Friend Finder as its parent corp. And I didn't know anything about buying a company either. So I got into porn, I didn't know anything about it. I became the CEO of Penthouse. Didn't really, wasn't really, didn't have four years or eight years or six years of, of an MBA behind me. But you know, I learned on the job, and uh, knew nothing about buying a company, doing what's called a management buyout. But you know, I started down the road and I bought it. So how long were you working for Penthouse before you started buying it? I worked for Penthouse uh, as either president of entertainment or managing director. They changed titles in the middle of the game, but. Uh, basically heading heading up production. I started in 2006 and I bought the company in 2016. So I was there for 10 years as some version of the executive producer and then the president of the division and then the, 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 the CEO. And, and then I bought it in early 2016. Wow, how much you pay for it? <laughs> well, aren't you interested? 6.5 <laughs> million. 6.5? Mm -hmm. And you got a loan or...? Mm -hmm. Nine million no, nine million dollars at twenty three percent interest. Uh, that's right. Why'd you rough. take nine million? Uh, because you had to. I had to have some operating capital. You know, there were some changes that had to happen. At that point, publishing was losing money, and uh, oh, so you took the magazine too. I took everything. I bought the whole company, oh. and publishing was losing money. I had to unfortunately terminate 26 people in New York that were the publishing division and move publishing to get to LA so I could turn the turn that ship around. Uh, and I had tried to buy it for three years, and unsuccessfully I could not find investors. And uh, everybody wanted to talk to me because it was penthouse, but at the end of the day, when it came to writing a check, that was a whole other situation. And plus, the company, the publishing division, was losing money. Uh, I was insistent that the magazine stay publishing. I said that we could turn it around, but nobody believed me. Everybody was like, oh, publishing's in the toilet. And I'm just like, yeah, but I've got a way to deal with it. So there was a lot of questions about it. So investors were hard to come by. You couldn't get institutional funding because it's obviously an adult company. So at the end of the day, uh, Friend Finder was literally going to close the company down. They were ready to fire everybody and just close it down and just run the website kind of on auto. And um, I had one option, which was a really, really difficult lender out of Chicago. $9 million at 23% interest. But I knew I could do it. I knew my numbers really well. I knew how I was going to turn it around, and I did. So I bought it, took on that debt paid off five and a half million of the note in two years, which meant we were kind of lean, like we couldn't spend a lot of money. Uh, we couldn't really grow. We were just, you know, trying to pay down debt, pay down debt, but pay down five and a half million in debt, 5.2. That's a lot. In two a years, lot. that's two years. crazy. And um, really we were set to refinance the debt on a real good path to, to growth. And um, my CFO was uh, embezzling money and falsifying financials. In a, in a whole scheme to do a hostile takeover of the company. So life went, life took a bad turn at that point. But so what happened? Uh, I had to put the company in bankruptcy to keep him at bay uh, and basically screw his plans. Uh, and they did get screwed. He's living in some shithole in Florida, in the Florida panhandle now. Um, his name's not important. Doesn't matter. His name's Don Slaughter. Oh. Slaughter, aptly named. Last name apt, um, but what that set that set into motion all series of events, which ended up being that the the second largest porn site in the world, X Videos, WGCZ to be exact, that's their corporate name, out of Prague, uh, would end up buying the company in an auction. Uh, wow, an auction! Yeah, for how much? Eleven point two. 
Whoa, really? So the price went way up from six point. Yeah, I mean, actually, as a CEO, I should be pretty proud because I took a six point five million dollar company, and in two years, somebody bought it for eleven point two. That's amazing. So good growth, you know. Uh, I will say, I think it was an overpayment. I don't know that it was worth eleven point two, but uh, it was an auction. People get. You know, they were bidding against MindGeek, and so it kind of bid up, right? But bought it for 11.2. Who's got the biggest one auction? So I was there for 10 weeks and um, was not working out. So I left. And now I'm working with Marcy, and we're going to launch a few new products. So. Well, that's an interesting turn of events. Yeah, yeah. So did, um, did you meet Bob Buccioni? I didn't, and it was one of the, you know, I don't have many sadnesses or regrets in my life but that's kind of one of them uh guccioni was alive at the time so guccioni lost the company in 2004 in a bankruptcy um his family had conspired to try to take the company all these sharks around him his wife had died and his wife was really the one that kept him on track and was the sharp business mind he was an artist and a bit of a nut and a genius, but, you know, a bit crazy. And um, he lost the company. He was just surrounded by a bunch of people who were very predatory with him. And without his wife there, he just couldn't hold it. So he lost it. Um, uh, a group of venture capitalists out of Florida bought it. And they got into a litigation with him immediately. He sued them. They sued him. So then I came on in 2006. And... I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I started doing my research when I came on to Penthouse, and his story is amazing. It's an amazing story. Uh, a guy that comes from nothing, builds a company to a billion dollars, and then loses it, and he would ultimately die in poverty in a trailer in Texas, in Plano, Texas. So it's a real rags to riches, back to rags. But really an amazing guy. Uh, much more fascinating than you, Hefner. More fascinating than Larry, frankly. I wanted to interview him. I wanted to do a documentary, but we were in the middle of a lawsuit, and the lawyers at the company said, absolutely not. You cannot talk to him. You cannot reach out to him. You cannot communicate with him. He then died in, um, I think it was 2010 or 11, 2010. And he died when I was uh, at, in Berlin for Venus. And I was getting an award for, I don't know, best executive something, best woman something, I don't know what it was, it was some award. And uh, I know he died that day and I accepted the award and I, you know, and I said to Bob Guccione, he just passed away and, and I need to, I'm gonna dedicate this to him, he was an amazing guy. Uh, so sadly, no. I ended up talking to his kids and one of my big projects inside Penthouse and probably the only regret I have about leaving Penthouse, well, I have regrets about it, but the big regret I have about leaving Penthouse is um, I have a, a project called American Emperor that I always wanted to do, which was the life and times of Bob Guccione, like a five-part series on Netflix or a five-part series on Amazon Prime because it is an amazing story. And I don't know that it'll ever be told. No one's really written a book. Nobody's really... people. Some people know his history and what he did when he owned Penthouse, but not many people. And, um, you know, Deuce on HBO is kind of that era, but I don't really, yeah, I don't really buy it. I don't like it. And uh, that was his, you know, if Deuce was the streets, that era, the Penthouse was his space at that same time. But, you know, fascinating guy. Mm. But I don't know that the story will ever get told now. So. I mean, I want to talk about the deuce, just not too much to give too much respect, but I want to go back. Did you make some good money? At working, Penthouse? Owning Penthouse? Did you yeah. walk away and... No. Yeah. No? You didn't walk away with any money? No, because my equity was tied up in the company, and when I had to put it into bankruptcy, that was, you know, that was the name of that tune. Really? Yeah. That's fucked. Yeah. Up. Oh, sorry. It's okay. It's okay, because you know what? Everything is a, um, is a door... That, that door that's closing behind you just, just because you just walked through it and you went into something else. I mean, look, they say that a millionaire, don't judge a millionaire by their first million, judge them by when they make a million, lose a million, make another million and lose another million, and then they make it a third time. That's when you, that's when you have respect, right? So I have a couple of companies that are going to launch that are going to be... I've taken some beatings. Major. 
<laughs> I said, I've taken and some beatings. And you're stronger for it, you know? You yeah. are stronger for the beatings that you take. You're wiser, you're stronger. I'll never hand my financials and my total trust over to anybody from here on out after that. That was a harsh lesson because that was the person. We were a lean company. We were a small company because we were paying down a bunch of debt. We only had 35 employees. I had a guy that was, you know, filling a couple of positions, CFO, COO, handling a lot. You know, it was really just the two of us. Very close to me, right behind me. Who was that? Which guy? It was Don Slaughter, the guy oh. that organized the hostile takeover. Okay. And, you know, I learned one thing that was very important. Uh, the person that's right behind you that's watching your back could also be watching it to figure out where they're going to put a knife into it, right? Oh, and that's I, always the issue. I know it. You let somebody really close to you to stand there to hopefully back you up and watch your back. You better be very comfortable with who that person is is people get jealous and they're envious you know what there's a lot of that and i don't want to put too much i've never put too much weight on the whole you know woman thing i mean i'm just i am who i am and i do what i do but i think there was also a real resentment about that that it was a woman that was owning penthouse a woman that was calling the shots at penthouse yeah. and a woman that was saying to some male executives you know what the fuck are you doing i mean that's hard to take mm -hmm. it's hard to take criticism from me i'm not people either love me or hate me and when you if, if i you know if i'm out on you and something happens and i'm like what the fuck were you doing I mean, that's not easy to take from me i'm tall i'm arrogant i'm You're strong yeah so it gets people get really upset with stuff like that yeah. You don't know it at the time. Because yeah. people are like, oh, well, I, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, stop sniveling. What the fuck were you doing? Uh, yeah. But it can cause some problems, you know. Uh, you went through some rough times, uh, you know, of course, in Central America. So those come, you bring them with you when you're doing business. Uh, I'm short. I'm not tall. But my presence is always big. overpowering and people get weird. And, and you know... They want to stick my back or do something, right? So I understand completely what how you might feel, even though I'm not a woman, but I'm shorter. So who knows? Maybe it has some type of parallels. You know, and, and also when you're strong, and you know this, everybody wants to challenge you. You know, there's always this inherent, whether they do or not is another story, but they always want to. There's a part of them that wants to. And when you're successful, no matter who you are and how you got there, there the there's always like, well, why are they there? How did they get that? The, what, what, it's just, it's human nature. It's the yeah. jungle. It just is what it is. It's the animals in the jungle. There's a hierarchy. And, um, you know, it's, it is what it is. And, and, and I spent a lot of time thinking that the world was my friend because I'm nice, you know. Oh, well, no, everybody's, you know, uh, nobody would do anything to me. I'm so nice. Yeah, no, not really. So I did a lot of growing up in this, but... Um, Someone just, I don't remember who it was. I was just somewhere and someone said, just today, I think, someone said something about, oh, I remember. Uh, they were talking about uh, the fire and I had to va evacuate all these animals. And they said, oh, that's, oh, God, that's horrible. I said, no, being in Somalia looking for firewood is horrible. Anything better than that is a good day. So... I have, I like have an amazingly blessed life, like amazingly blessed life. Yeah. Did I lose a $9 million company? Yeah, I did. Uh, but guess what? I can create another $9 million company. I'm going to create a $50 million company. That's what they don't take away from you is they don't take away your ability to be successful. Somebody can come grab your house in Atlanta, grab your house here, grab your house there, grab this building there, whatever the hell but you're still left with you. And you created it once, twice, three times, you can create it again. Yeah. That they can't take that away from you. You just have to keep your spirit intact. That's right, you gotta just stay focused. It's like, yeah, okay, whatever. Yeah. Matter of fact, to some extent, it gives you more um, focus on it because it's like, really? You th I don't know, I'm sorry, you think I'm on the ground? Nah, yeah, we can talk about that in a few yeah. weeks. Sometimes when they really think you're on the ground, you really want to get back. That's right. So that's a, that's a right. good factor to push you. That is right. But do you, have, do you remember any of the directors that you thought were really talented through the time, your experience? Adult directors? Yeah. Look, um, 
I think PT when he was on game was really good. Um, you know, he wasn't there half the time because PT would be like, oh, Jason, just shoot this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that um, you want to know who I think is a really good director? Like an astonishing director. Uh, he shoots his own stuff. And I'm talking about a director for uh, dialogue and being able to get good dialogue and get it done and do a good feature film. I mean, feature films are not a big thing anymore. There's not that many of them around, but let's talk old school feature film. I love them. They're great. Uh, Mike McCormick. Really? Quasar. Wow. Phenomenal. 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 Really? If I were shooting a movie right now, I would have Quasar shoot it. Really? He's that good. Wow. Yeah. So good he's... at dialogue, good at vision. Um, I think that um, for sex... I mean, Larry used to be great, Blair, uh, Shishi LaRue, because he was a great cheerleader, mm -hmm. you know? He has a lot of personality. He was hard to edit yeah. because he never shut up. Oh, yeah, yeah, girl, yeah, spit on it. It was like, oh, my God, I just need one minute of clean ah. sound. But nobody got more invested in the sex than that I, I saw than Larry. Like, I'll tell you who I, and I won't name this person by name because they're at times a friend of mine on and off oh, yeah. but you know I've seen directors who the minute the sex starts rolling they walk off and they leave it to the cameraman mm -hmm. that's not a good director I've seen it um, on features yeah especially yeah yeah on features particularly they'll direct the dialogue and they'll block it and all that jazz but they'll walk off when the sex starts and I'm like what what like what are you doing um I don't know. See, I always thought I was a really good director, so I compare the directors I hired many times to me, and I'm like, you know, the question is this. Who do I think is better than me? I think Larry is better uh, in sex. I think McCormick was better in, and is better to this day in terms of getting really good dialogue and getting good performers out, performances out of actors. Um, I think... God, who else? I don't know now to think about it. John Leslie? I never worked around John Leslie or worked with John Leslie. That whole crew, Leslie, Joey. Uh, uh, Stagliano, Joey. Uh, Joey. I never, I came on when they were going out and they were a whole other world. They yeah. were the Stagliano world. They were very different than me. So, I you know. It. I mean, Stagliano's a pervert. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know what? You kind of have to be, and that's a great thing. Yeah, I mean, look, of that's some of the best stuff comes out of that, comes out of that just insane perversion. Yeah, Somebody great. was just telling me a story about, uh, about uh, Jamie Gillis. The first time they met him, he walked up and was talking to this girl and then just slapped her out of the middle of nowhere. I was like, what? You know, they didn't have a problem with that for whatever reason. Jamie Gillis, you know, yeah. with, when I have people in here, you know, talking about. Yeah. And I know Jamie Gillis, and he's dead. But, you know, yeah. I work with side-by-side side with him yeah. in 91 or something. And I used to talk to him on a set. I think he liked me because he was, you know, he, he, talking to me in a certain way. And he was uh, a cool, crazy person. Did you ever yeah. meet him? No. I mean, just in passing. Just right. in passing. Never yeah. really sat down and talked to him. But most of the actors that knew him, Jamie Gillis was the number one guy. Yeah. He was number one. Yeah. Peter North said it. Uh, Ron Jeremy said it. Yeah. You know, Ron Jeremy said one time he wanted to meet Jamie Gillis, and that Jamie Gillis wouldn't meet him, right? <laughs> he was that big. Like, no, 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 you know, no. And they're both Jewish and all that in New York, you know, Jewish. And um, I guess he goes to the bathroom. They're both in the same bathroom. He just got having sex with a girl. It's in the interview with Ron. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and... Ron's looking at Jamie Gillis because Jamie Gillis was a maniac. Yeah. So he's got blood and feces yeah. on his yeah. penis. And Ron's like this. And then <laughs> I guess he he zips up. They go near the door and Jamie goes, girls are a little wild or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, Oh, he messed, grabbed his hair or something. And he just walked out. How funny. Didn't even, but he knew he wanted to meet him, but he's just a crazy guy. It's, you know, and then Joey told me a story that Jamie was so scared to fly, right? Mm -hmm. And so that he would <laughs> carry a pair of panties, black girls' panties, that they have a strong scent, and that's yeah, what really yeah, makes yeah, me yeah, crazy. Yeah, Sometimes yeah. I smell a girl, 
I have a really good nose. And I would smell some of the girls, yeah. you know, the black girls, pussies, and I would turn into like a werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like it was, you know, primal. Very yeah, yeah, primal. Yeah. And so Jamie used to sniff it when he would be taken off or landing. So he would just forget about the airplane. That's funny. Is that crazy? Gosh, I'm so sad I was never on a plane next to him. That would have been an interesting experience. All <laughs> right. So anyways, I, I talked to him numerous times. Yeah. But he those, was, I mean, those guys back then, you know, that was that was, was a different era. It was beautiful. You know, it was, a, I mean, I came in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. It was so mysterious, so underground, mm -hmm. so cool. Mm -hmm. You know, so I was lucky to be part of it. And I got to be part of, you know, I was 27 years or whatever. That's a long time. But, um... Yeah, I, so when I came in, uh, it was just that time when all also the old New York and Cleveland guys were just moving out, like Butchie and Arrow uh -huh. and that whole crew. And, uh -huh. and they were not far from when it was illegal. So, you know, Ruben Sturman was, it was in Boron at that time, and Russ Hampshire was still around, and they had all been busted, and it was, you know, it was just a few years after it had been legalized. So you had all the guys that used to talk about the suitcases of cash and going out the back window in San Francisco as Vice was coming in the front door. And, you know, I almost kind of missed, I, I regret that I missed that time, you know? Yeah. You know? It was, I mean, I wasn't part of all that, but I knew Butchie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Butchie's the um, director or the producer of Deep Throat. Mm -hmm. His father, I have another story. Tell I, me. His father was Tony, I guess Big Tony or something like that. You know, I heard this story from the guy who, the, really, what happened. So, you know, you might even know the guy, but I'm a, his name was uh, Sidney. Oh, Sidney uh, Neekirk? Exactly. Yeah. So Sidney Neekirk <laughs> told me that his father said, here's the master of Deep Throat. Don't give it to my son. I have to leave because I'm going to... You're up because I'm being chased by the FBI, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And so he says, Butchie says, I want my master when he's, go you know, when his father's gone. Butchie's a, a real guy, right? A real guy. And his, like his brother or cousin was shot down in front of his house. So, you know, mm -hmm. they're real guys, real gangster guys. Mm -hmm. Butchie was cool. I talked to him. He was nice, you know, numerous times. But, um, you know, you, people aren't going to say, hey, I'm a gangster. They don't talk like that, right? But anyways, so... I guess Butchie said, either come here and sit down with me or else and give me my master. Yeah. He said, I'm not going to sit down with you. I'm not going to give you your master. Your father told me not to give it to you. And I'm a man of my word. So then I was about ready to have a hit on him. And then Roberto Di Bernardo mm -hmm. was Sidney's friend. And went for the sit down, mm -hmm. and so you don't go against Roberto Di Bernardo. He was a powerful person, mm -hmm. so that's a wild little story. And there's more stories that he told me, but that's an interesting story, huh? Yeah, that's a great story. You know, that's and a he great saved story. his life because they're gonna kill him, mm -hmm. just like they killed TV. Mm -hmm. And they shot him supposedly in the back of the head, you know, or something mm -hmm. like that. You know that story? Mm -hmm. You don't know? Do you ever heard of Roberto Di Bernardo? Mm -hmm. Right. So he ran New York. But that's another, it's all about you today. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good story, though. It's a good story about Butchie. Yeah. He's, I liked him. He was cool. And I, ironically, his cousin or somebody in the company moved right next door to me over there in my apartment complex called Versailles on Avenue San Luis mm -hmm. in 1992. Mm -hmm. They looked at me hard and I said, what? You know, don't look at me because I'm, I'm down. But, you know, it was ironic that, the guy's right next door to me, and then this is strange. Well, it's funny because the first AVN I ever went to when I was working for Vivid, I went to dinner with Steve and Marcy, and, you know, they knew everybody. And so there was just this big this big parade of people coming by the table to go, hey, Stevie. I mean, the guys that knew him for a long time would call him Stevie, which he hated. And it's like, yo, Stevie, you know, da da And I was like, where are these guys from? Central Casting? I mean, they were just classic. Right, right. And then they just weren't around a couple of years later, you know? They'd yeah. all disappeared, and they'd all passed away. They'd all retired. But it was a, it was just a really rich time, you know? Yeah. With, rich with culture. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was cool. It was unbelievable. I'm so happy to be part of it. Yeah. You know? 
I got the tail end of it, but still part of it. Yeah, it was cool. Me too. So did you, did the people, how many times did people, the actors or the, or people, I guess you're the director, so maybe, you know, you're producing too, but did people ever come up to you and say, hey, you want to be in a movie? You, know, you want to be a, a star talent or anything like that? No? Never? No. Okay, the actors never said, hey, like Mark Davis was wondering, you know, at the Avocado Ranch, hey, does nobody ever say anything? No, that was Rocco just thinking that I was going to be in the scene with him, but no. <laughs> no, I was just too, no, I don't put off that vibe at yeah. all. Yeah, you're pretty. No, no, I go in, I'm, you know, I always had a camera on my shoulder, uh -huh. right? That's what everybody remembers me as, having you, a camera on my shoulder, and I'm and, just business. And you didn't dress up, I know. Mm -mm. You didn't show your body, so yeah, I can see. Maybe a different story when I was at AVN and I was dressed up. Yeah. I was like, whoa, Kelly, but, but, you know, still, I mean, I just, you know, you know, people at a certain, for such a long time, it's just like, you get into a particular relationship yeah, yeah. with them and that the relationship is just, is what it is. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're pretty strong, so I can see, and nobody's going to really say anything. Yeah. So. Well, I want to move on to some other questions, but let's just close this chapter. Okay. And in two words. Can you describe your experience in the business? Epiphany or transformational. I'm a very different person now than I was when I walked into the business. For the good. That's nice to hear. One thing, I'm very happy when the people, you know, from the business, because this is, you know, a big part of my life, and the people understand how great and important the business is and was to them. Mm -hmm. You know, when some people don't understand it and take it for granted and then afterwards disrespect it, mm -hmm. it's a heartbreak. Mm -hmm. I say, you don't really know what you're talking about usually, mm -hmm. you know, but I, you know, I'm always happy to hear the positivity. You know, and this show is, I want it to be a positive show about, you know, mm -hmm. All the facets of sex and the business. Mm -hmm. no? So, and you know what? Uh, I, I, I respect people who get into the business and decide that it's not for them and they leave. But I am not wild about people who get in the business, decide it's not for them, leave, and then blame all the problems for the rest of their life on the business. <laughs> it's like, brother, you walked in with those problems. We're not therapy. We weren't there to solve them. And now you're walking out with the same problems and that's, you need to own that. People just need to own their stuff. I just generally, the, the thing I dislike most um, in people, I guess, is um, victims and whiners. It's just, it's like, shut up. Just shut up and get on with it and, and do what you need to do. And, you know, you're, you, yeah, I can't stand people that whine about their lives. Maybe, you know, they needed their ass beat more often. <laughs> <laughs> they needed to work in the pits with you. Yeah, I liked Appreciate it, actually, it. you know. You know what else was, was transformational to me is going to Central America and going to Latin America and going to the third world and seeing how people really live. And now, come here, Southern California, Nice weather, you're driving your nice car, you just came from some great meal, and you want to tell me how bad your life is? Shut up. Just shut up. Shut the front door. No. That's why I always say, I'm not looking for water and firewood in the Sudan. Like, my life is great. I mean, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. I remember sleeping in the dirt in the mountains of Guatemala. So my bed is great. I remember taking, you know, a bucket of water for a shower. My hot shower is super. Uh, and my hot shower is super, but even if I was in a, you know, a little apartment in Hollywood, my hot shower would be super. I mean, I just, it's, we're, yeah. we're blessed, you know. That's crazy. We're blessed. I'll give you a story about similar to that, you know what I mean? Which, you know, makes you say, hey, so we were working in this mine, right? It's in the edge of Death Valley, right? So it's very hot or it gets very cold. Mm -hmm. Worked in there from 75 to 80 and then took a couple years off and then worked from 83 to 87 or mm -hmm. something like that, whatever. My father blew the whole mountain up, right? It was fun. I used to steal the dynamite when I was a kid and go <laughs> blow stuff up, right? But um, <laughs> a 
but here's the story, you know, that relates to that is that my father had a house, but, you know, you can't go back and forth to your house when you're stuck up on a mine, mm -hmm. you know, on the top of a mountain, right? So he bought a little trailer, you know, and he had to get water into the trailer. So we would load up these 55-gallon drums, fill them up with the water, stick them on top of the hill, and then run a hose down so you get some type of centrifugal mm -hmm. force and mm -hmm. pressure, mm -hmm. right? Anyways, there was no hot water, right? You'd have to boil it to get hot water. Mm -hmm. It's like from the 1800s. So my father would be on the tractor on the big D9 all day, you know, big D9 Caterpillar and mm -hmm. the dust and dirt and crazy, you know, all day long, the hot sun, you know, he's big, he's 300 pounds, six foot three, big, big dude. And um, so the little teeny bath, we're talking in 1969 little trailer, mm -hmm. right? Because this is 1974, 75. So the trailer is like old, mm -hmm. beat up, right? It could have been a 65 trailer, right? right? Whatever, but it's small. Right? But I'm small, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm a little kid. But the bathtub, my father's big. I mean, his arm is he's big, right? Like a barbarian. Real, you know, and big. New York, big. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so the little bathtub, they fill it up with hot water. And so he would take a bath with all that dirt, big guy. You couldn't even, he would could barely fit in there anyways. Right. Couldn't even fit in there, right? Then my stepmom would take, you know a bath and then me and my brother would have to flip a coin who's going to take the next bath because the water in the same water is so this much of dirt in the top of the water and white with us ivory soap yeah, 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 yeah. piled up and it's cold and we're not we're not getting hot water we got the cold water oh man and i used to say yes yeah, no big deal but people cry and whine i say spend a little time with me yeah. And I used to work four or five days straight when I used to shoot my movies. And, you know, people say, well, you're a maniac. And I say, well, I don't want to go back. I didn't mind the mine, but I didn't like working on trucks. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I thought that's an interesting story. Yeah. Right. And even now, you know, I don't want to rag on talent, but. You know, I find myself, I sound like my mother, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm on set sometimes and you have talent going, oh, oh I've been here for four hours. And, uh, and I'm like, dude, 16 hours up at Big Bear, in the cold, sex on a rock. What I mean, you know, come on. That's just the way it used to be, right? Those yeah. are the movies we used to do. The sets, I, I would never complain. And I would be on set 20 hours or even 24 hours. Mm-hmm. You know, I did a couple of 24s. Yeah, you get tired, but where I used to work, I used to work 24-hour shifts sometimes anyways, mm -hmm. sometimes 40-hour shifts, you know, because if the Department of Transportation was coming in, you'd have to get stuff ready. But, yeah, I mean, if you're on a set, you're not really, you're working, but the talent's not working. Yeah, go take a nap. Yeah, you take a nap, free food, maybe a little sex in the bathroom or back room. <laughs> Right, I mean, it's the holiday of holidays. Yes. People don't even understand. Yeah, you know, they've lost their mind completely. But um, let's talk about the deuce, mm -hmm. right? Just a little bit. I'm not going to give it much respect. Okay. What, what do you think of the deuce? Uh, I'll tell you what I think about it. I only watched the first two episodes and I stopped watching it. I mean, yeah. I just, you know, I, I had a political issue with it even ahead of time because they didn't have talent, adult talent. I think a couple of people like Janie Hamilton consulted with them, but they didn't have talent on set to really call it out, you know, call out what was real and what wasn't real. And, you know, I just, yeah, I didn't buy it at all. It was offensive a little bit yeah. to me. For me, you know, because I'm very uh, into the business and very, you know, 27 years. And now I'm doing this, so it's going to add more years, right? But, yeah. I didn't buy it. Well, I also heard interviews with the producers who had been researching it for so long. And, and I don't remember exactly what they said, but it was, yeah, you know, they, they laid a lot on the exploitation of the times. And I, I mean, I talked to Jane. I talked to, you know, Randy Spears, who got into it back when it was 16 millimeter film in Times Square. That's not their story. That's not their story. What look? There's always some somebody being exploited. There's always somebody that's not happy with something. I get that, but the general vibe of that was the people that were in that world loved it. They had a great time. There was the same great camaraderie that we had for many many years in this industry, yeah. and uh, they started. 
the producers of The Deuce started from the perspective of, well, we know it was a horribly exploitive time, but we'll show you that there was a little bit of good. And it's no, it was, it was a good time with an edge of exploitation. And it's just a different, it's, it's an outsider's view of it. And, and it's, and they think it's so, um, you know, kind of so radical and so, uh, you know, titillating that they have nudity and they're talking about pornography and it's so, you know, uh, so edgy. It's like, nah, it's nah. A, it's another example, you know, of people, outsiders, like you said, and know nothing, and try and grab what they can and rip off the business. Mm-hmm. And I talked to everybody, and I was a big porn fan. I went from the 80s. Mm-hmm. Randy Spears started two years before me, but mm-hmm. I spoke to all the people from New York because mm-hmm. I'm a distributor, mm-hmm. and I mm-hmm. used to go visit everybody. I know everybody, and mm-hmm. really pretty deep, you know, deeper than almost anybody, mm-hmm. you know, around today. Mm-hmm. Deeper than any of the actors because I know all the people, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and they're dying and they're mm-hmm. whatever. But yeah, it's just is a atrocity, mm-hmm. I think. And that's how I see it. But, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. you know, that's all they get. We both agree. They don't know what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. So what do you think about the debate? Who do you want to win? The presidential debate? Yeah. Oh, God. I kind of just want Trump out, but... Huh. Um, I mean, who do I want? Who do I want? And who do I think can win? Those are two separate things. Yeah. Who do I want? Mayor Pete, because he's the smartest one. Who's? Mayor Pete, because he's the smartest one. Mayor Pete? Pete Buttigieg. Pete, okay. Yes, because he's the smartest. Do I think he can win? No. Do I think that if he were the one running as president, would they make much about him and his husband being in the White House and who's the first lady? I mean, there's just, he's too vulnerable because, because he's gay, frankly. Mm-hmm. But he's the smartest one. He's a Rhodes Scholar. He's a moderate. He's down the center. I don't know if Elizabeth Warren can win because she's pretty left, you know. And I'm a leftist, but she's so progressive. I mean, the debate last night... I didn't watch the whole debate, but it's all legitimate questions from the centrists like Biden, which is, how are you going to pay for this? How are you going to pay for this? Amy Klobuchar, but I don't think she's that, you know, I don't know if she's got that much oomph and excitement. Biden, I love him, but God, he's, you know, he's he's like my granddad. Um, I don't know. I mean... I want Obama back. <laughs> Wait, can't you run again? Really? I want somebody that's smart, that's strategic, that is young and dynamic. And I don't see that. I don't see that. Like I, like I want a piece of this candidate and a piece of that candidate and a piece of that candidate all rolled into one, and they, they're not there. But I do believe that any number of them can beat Trump because I think Trump is just self, like he's, immolating at this moment. He's like self-imploding at this moment because he's just batshit crazy. He's what, crazy? Batshit crazy. Is he crazy? Oh, oh, he's going down right now. Really? Just, oh, over the whole Syria thing and the whole mess in Syria and the whole impeachment. And Yeah, he's... I just... I turn on the news every morning waiting to hear that he has gone running out of the White House naked screaming across the White House lawn because he's lost his mind. I kind of am waiting for that moment because I think he is close to that really yeah you've listened to him lately i even he's loony yeah he's fucking loony i mean he's he's always incomprehensible but it's become worse yeah i know he makes some statements but some of the ideas he had i you know they made sense to me trying to regulate all the tariffs from the you know other countries you know that makes sense to me if we're going to pay canada whatever they were paying, 300% tax or whatever it was they were talking about. And oh, we're giving them a lesser tax, you know, they're, or they're not charging us, or they're charging us 300% or whatever they're charging us, and we don't charge them the same. And that for any other country, I think that why, would, um, <clears throat> why wouldn't we be on fair grounds or even grounds? I don't disagree with that. I don't disagree that we should negotiate better trade deals, but uh, putting tariffs on China. He keeps talking about how we're making all of, a lot of money. We're not making any money. I pay $4 more for every box of cat food I buy for the rescues that I have. Tariffs are a tax. 
So I think there's smarter, better ways to do it. Um, you know, we could talk politics forever, but yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would say this point. I was in China, mainland China, mm -hmm. seven years ago mm -hmm. when we were really in pain, mm -hmm. right? And in China, I saw all these huge skyscrapers being built, 20, 30, 40 mm -hmm. in each city. And I went to like five cities. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, that is wild. I mean, we're supposed to be such a rich country and we can't even do anything. And these guys are building, you know, what, a hundred New Yorks all over the place. I mm -hmm. was just like amazed. You know, and that tells me that our money is over there or money is over there and they've got all the money. Yeah, but they went, they pretty much went bankrupt doing that. I mean, yeah. They've got cities over there that are just deserted. I heard that too. That, the yeah, day. they, you know, they they went through a real shift in in their, you know, economic model, and they kind of went at lightning speed into the new world and into a mixed economy and <clears throat> capitalism. Some forms of capitalism. They opened up their markets and they just started spending money on infrastructure. Infrastructure which we haven't spent money on infrastructure in a long time. That's why our bridges collapse. <laughs> and, um, you know, they overspent, and then they had to pull it back. And, uh, you know, they've got issues. I mean, they've got 2 billion people they got to feed over there, and, they're, you know, they got massive. If you were there, you were in Beijing, and you probably know you can't breathe in Beijing. You can see Beijing as you fly into it from 200 miles out. It's just a brown, disgusting cloud. It's the most polluted, one of the most polluted cities in the world. I, I the truth is, I didn't see it that bad when I was oh, there. I was there four years ago, and it was it unbelievable because it moved so quickly from a bicycle culture to a car culture. Because now you had a middle class that had money to buy cars, and now there's no bicycles on the road. You go to Vietnam. Have you been to Vietnam? Oh, yeah, been to Vietnam. yeah, you go to Vietnam, and now I was in Vietnam about nine months ago. And in Saigon, it's now, it's still hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bicycles, that's true. But now they're like the mini China. They've got buildings going up everywhere. And you know, in Asia, everybody loves like uh, LED light shows on their buildings and all these like flashing lights. I mean, they're really into bling, right? Uh -huh. It's like really bling time. Saigon is like that. It's just f freaking skyscrapers. The higher, the better, the blingier, the better. A uh, lot of money coming in from uh, from India, from uh, from mainland China coming in. Uh, a lot of it's self investment. I mean, Vietnam's going through that same evolution. I mean, I think every country, you know, has the same evolutionary path as they go through it. The real, I'll tell you where China is brilliant, and we're not, is Africa. China's so Our, heavily invested in Africa right Nigeria, now. Nigeria, other, yeah. Yep, in, investing in infrastructure. And high-speed rail and roads, and they got the money, but also that gives them the influence. So they're going to own Africa. We just write it off. We don't even know how many countries are in Africa. 26, I think. But we don't even know that. We just know it's this big, like hole that nobody knows about it's just i don't know we're always sending aid there and it's just a mess and there's a bunch of dictators no there's a bunch of sophisticated cities in africa yeah. africa is an incredibly wealthy rich uh uh continent and we just chalked it off yeah and china was like yeah okay well we won't chalk it off right. so i you know i don't know it's yeah. it's tough i think we have pro i think we have a lot of problems here that we should be working on electoral reform and long-term thinking as opposed to short-term thinking and infrastructure. I think we should get off of spending so much on, on our military. And yeah. although I don't think we should have pulled out of Syria, um, we only had a thousand troops there and they were holding the line with three or four huge, you know, you had Syria breathing down everybody's neck. You had Turkey, Erdogan's crazy as shit, batshit crazy. You have ISIS, you know, uh, in jail. You got the Kurds trying to hold the hold the line. You got Russia breathing down everybody's neck, and we just had a thousand guys there holding everybody, saying to everybody, "Just stay calm, because we're Americans. So just stay calm." And everybody was. We pulled them out, and the shit hit the fan. So uh, I don't believe in isolationism. I think as an, as a, as the strongest country on the planet, we need to 
be involved, but our influence needs to be a positive influence, not a negative one. And we need to, we need to be engaged globally because there is no, you know, there, it's a globe now. It's not just this place and that place and that place. We have to think about solutions on a global level and, uh, we're the best ones to to work to mobilize the world, and I think Trump's just alienated the world. <laughs> so, plus he's just an idiot. So I just can't stand listening to him talk because he's a moron. But the world is getting small, quick. It is. It's so small, <clears throat> and that has a lot to do with where this industry is, because you know, since Facebook and 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 CNN, I take it all back to CNN. CNN tells us every day or reminds us every day that we are a planet of 7 billion people and you're just one little ant in the anthill. And, and coupled with the fact that we now are mobile, so we don't live around where our parents are anymore. We don't live around where we went to school. We move to the other end of the world or we move to the other end of the country or at the very least the, end of the, the other end of the state. And so then Facebook comes up and Facebook says, we'll be your family. You can, you can have a Facebook account and you can have all these friends. You may not even know half of them. They're certainly not going to come help you change a tire in Compton at three o'clock in the morning, but they're your friends and you can share with them what you eat and you can share with them what you think and what your politics are. And when you have a good day and a bad day, I give these people this illusion of having, having a community and a family and a whole bunch of friends. But really, we don't know the person that lives to the right of us. We don't know the person that lives to the left of us. We've lost track of most of the people we grew up with. Some of us have wide circles of friends. Others are very isolated. So you have Facebook come up, and then you have what is what was the first big change in this industry was you have cam girls come up. Cam girls are like the adult version of Facebook. So you may be some guy who schleps off to work every day and isn't that comfortable, shy, not comfortable around women. But you can go home and talk to a cam girl and you can have a make-believe relationship. You can have a girlfriend. She's, and she's an easy girlfriend because if she gets out of control, you're just like, ding, turn her off. Close the computer and push her over there. You don't need to deal with her. So you can have a fake girlfriend. Now you can have... You know, all of these kind of YouTube relationships with porn stars. So, you know, you have a business that's moved, as we said in the very beginning, moved from the studios, the outlets, the fans, the studios, the fans, and, and the actors were over here. They had to come through the studios to talk to their fans. You don't have to do that anymore. Now they can be the, the, the late night fake girlfriend to that fan. They can make the private movie for that fan. They can have the conversations. They can check in on, on direct messages six times a day going, oh, here I am in bed. Oh, here I am having breakfast. You have this sense of this false digital relationship. Maybe it's healthy. I don't know if it's healthy or not. Maybe it is healthy because it gives people the comfort of feeling they have a relationship, even if it's a pretty vapid one. I mean, well, how do you see the future of the adult business? Um, I think all the studios are going to collapse um, or get absorbed into each other. I think MindGeek will stick around because they're smart. Uh, you know, they have a couple of things that could totally trip them up, like net neutrality could decide they're going to throttle the, the, the speed on the Internet and kill them by choking up the pipe, but, and the payment processors could, could kill them. So their world depends on other factors, but I figure they'll be the last guy standing. Um, and I think the re these kind of fake, uh, you know, virtual relationships will, will continue for the next few years. That's how everybody's going to monetize. Um, Which is the girls. The girls doing to clips and talking to you and texting you and you text them and all, just all of that sort of, you know, do I want to do I want to text Brad Pitt and ask him how he's feeling today? Sure. Well, that's what you can do with your favorite star now. So you know, that's what that's the business Marcy and I are, are launching is to facilitate that for for talent that doesn't have the time or doesn't have the wherewithal or doesn't have the inclination to really um, um, grow that, that relationship and that business for themselves. Um, and I think ultimately, 
it's everybody's been talking about it for years and years and years, but it hasn't happened. But I think it will ultimately has to go there. Is um, completely virtualized sex. I think that's the way it goes. You've got you're wearing a bodysuit stimulus. She's wearing bodysuit stimulus. She's on the other side of the planet, and you're controlling it by voice command across Alexa. <laughs> that's Robots too, I think, part mm -hmm. of it. And robots, yes, absolutely. AI and robotics and, yeah, absolutely. That's where it all goes. You know, at Penthouse, I love to think about the future of, of, all, of technology in general and then how it applies to the adult space. And so years ago, we launched uh, 3D channels. And we were the only people to launch linear 3D channels. And we made a lot of money for about two years on those channels. And we were shooting a ton of stuff in 3D. And I would get interviewed about it all the time, and people would say, so is this the future? And I would say, no, it's not the future, because I'm doing it, so it's now. Mm -hmm. And I said, but it's not, you know, you can't, you can't talk about 3D, or talk about VR, or talk about immersive realities. It's never that thing. That thing is just a stop sign on a road. It's all moving to some place and you have to understand where is it moving to ultimately what's the ultimate thing at the end of the road so at the beginning of the road is us 126,000 years ago dropping out of trees going into caves and you know scratching images of us fucking that you know memorializing what what did we scratch on the walls we scratched us hunting and killing animals to eat we, we scratched on the wall pregnant women. That was a big image for women that were pregnant because that was life renewing itself. We um, scratched on the wall images of us having sex. Those are the primal things that motivate us. So we, we tried to create those images when we dropped out of the trees. And now it's been a matter for 126,000 years of perfecting that image through art, then through film, then through television, then making television personal through VCRs, and then moving it down the line. But the ultimate place it moves, it's always moved to making it more and more and more real and more and more personal. It wasn't good enough to see it in a movie theater because you had other people around you. It wasn't good enough to see it at home on a scratchy VHS tape. You wanted to see it just a little clearer. And then you got to see it on your computer screen. It was a little bit clearer. Then you got to see it as HD, then as 3D, then as VR. So it's always moving to making it more and more real to you, more and more inclusive. Then it's cam girls that are talking directly and they're saying, TT boy, they're saying your name. They're telling you what you look like. They're telling you what that they're going to do for you personally. If that's the path, that's the trajectory, making it more personal and making it more real, then what's the end game? Totally immersive VR sex. That's the end game. That's the natural end of it all. Is that we're all a bunch of fat blobs like Wally sitting in a chair having having imaginary sex, well, which is not good, by the way. But it's terrible. I think yeah, I terrible. love the kissing, the touching. Yeah, I'm a lover. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I love that. You appreciate a nice kiss. Yes, and all that. the tactile feel. Yeah. But all the gamers, that's exactly what they're going to do, sit in front of their game, and they're going to have virtual sex, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what everybody's going towards gaming, mm -hmm. like Hollywood is being lost, I think. And look at what happens. You have, like, DoorDash, right? So delivering food to you, delivering products to you from Amazon, da da, da. Everything is about staying in your apartment, being isolated in your world. If a gamer never had to get up off the couch... You know, if they didn't have to go to the bathroom, that would just be a great thing for them. So it's all about staying in there in front of your screen, you know, and it's uh, it's not healthy and it's not good. But And there'll come a time, I think, when we realize it's not healthy and we'll go back to something else. But right now, that's definitely the trajectory. Maybe it's the end. <laughs> Could be. Could be the end. Well, you know, Stephen Hawkins said uh, AI would uh, 99 years until we're... Right. Yeah. Probably. Stephen Hawkins, before he died... You know, great visionary said, uh, "AI will will take take out the human race." Wow, ninety nine years. Right now, I see it doing it because right now it seems to me like I don't know. We've had men and women, you know, love each other or like each other or you know, sexually interested in each other mm -hmm. for what I guess sixty thousand years. Since they we dropped say. out of the trees. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. 
And so now people are going their own way, or whether they're being like manipulated to go their own way with other sexes, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, and mm -hmm. like the man and woman, like man's bad and woman doesn't like man now. Mm -hmm. And it seems a lot to me, like, you know, and um, I see that divide and conquer, everybody's being divided. And so when they're completely divided, how are they going to have sex and reproduce, mm -hmm. which collapses humanity, which I believe is, you know, the virus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they destroy us. Now, you know, we can't see it, but it's here. But anyway, so say something nicer. What's your favorite food? Either sushi or Thai food. Uh, where's the best sushi place around here? Oh, Honshu on Mason, right down the street from you. Really? Yeah. Have you been to Honshu? Probably. Honshu's right next to Vaughn's in that little, really? on 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 Mason and uh, Devonshire. They're great. I want to get you and Marcy over to Katsuya. Have you eaten Katsuya? Yeah, I love you, Katsuya. You, you, about ka ka you should find the one, there is a Katsuya on Ventura Boulevard, not associated to the Katsuya in Hollywood and at uh, yeah. LA Live. One time we you talking about the LA Live one? All of them. I, yeah. All the costumes are good to me. Yeah. Well, but mostly in Seattle. When Cino. you move, yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to say, when you move downtown, we'll come down to Katsuya at okay. LA Live. Okay. They have great, they have great food. Great, right? This Rock costume. shrimp. Yeah. Super, super, super. Right they've got great sushi. Yeah, uh, Robert Roll and uh, crispy rice, spicy oh, tuna. Oh, crispy rice, spicy tuna. That's one of my favorites. Yeah. But without going to to LA Live or downtown or, or or Hollywood, if I'm just talking about neighborhood, Hunchu's really good. Really, I I'll I take, there. Yeah, yeah, I got to take you there, and we'll we'll order the things that are really good. <laughs> right. That's a deal. Right, we are done, and this is Tiki Boy out. Thanks, Kelly Holland, for spending this much time with me, and a great interview. And peace in the world, peace and love, because that's really what I like. All right.